everyone. Give me a second while I make sure I have everybody on Spreaker and Facebook live video. make an announcement on Facebook, but it should show up anyway. I'm going to sing this song. I'm going to keep it going. I'm going to sing this song. Invite the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, I had to keep my computer monitor on. to come in, we're going to sing a song, he'll understand, and say well done, we're going to preach about the subject matter, we're going to first we're going to invite all my listeners and viewers on my list, we're going to preach our sermon, and then I pray and ask in Jesus' name that I don't forget this time to offer up a prayer of repentance at the end. Not my 
well done If when this life Of labor is ended And the reward Of the race you have run Sweetest rest Prepared for the faithful Will be his bless And final Well done Oh, when I At the cross of redemption, he'll understand and say, Well done. Last fourth and last verse. But if you try. From the word you begun, take up your cross, run quickly to meet him. He'll Well done. Hallelujah! <laughs> All right. I love that song. I love that song. I hope y'all was singing along. You were singing along with me. Okay, bear with me for a second. I forgot to type in on Facebook that... Um, Facebook that uh, I was making a, pr a presentation, so I'm going to do that right now. Bear with me, all of you, and then we're going to uh, pray. We're going to pray for all the uh, all the people in the disaster area. We're going to pray for everybody. We're going to pray for all the people in the disaster area uh, uh, and for their deliverance. And everybody who is even my you know Facebook friends, family, extended family in Florida and in Texas. And in Puerto Rico and in all the islands over there, everywhere there's a there's a disaster. You got forest fires in California. We got all kinds of things going on all over the the planet. You know, all over the planet. And uh so I'm putting right now on Facebook. Oops. Currently currently 
doing a video podcast, please join me. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> Currently doing a video podcast, please join me. Make sure I spelled that right. I put that up there. Um, and I, I want to tell all of you who are on watching me on Facebook Live, I'm doing this from my telephone. And lately, I, I tried to do the audio the other day. And it seems with the audio, more than with the video, it's a limited time uh, with Facebook audio. So I'm going to encourage all of you, if you, if, if you see the post that says visit me on Spreaker to listen to the audio cast, I want to encourage all of you to do that. Because even this video, this Facebook video, those of you on Facebook video, I'm pretty sure the devil's going to throw up a phone call or something uh, to drop the signal, and you won't and you won't get the full message. But you can get the full message. You can watch the video, but um, click over in your in your time if you want to even share this message with someone else. Click over to to the uh, Spreaker.com link that comes up. It says says on some of you, you know, it says when I'm doing a live show like this, it comes up and it's a brown, actually it's, it's a picture of my, my uh, minister's license. And it says, you know, join Daryl, he's doing this sermon on Spreaker.com. And, you know, I want to encourage all of you to come to Spreaker.com or uh, I'm going to work on doing Skype better. I'm not trying to get people away from Facebook, but the thing is I've learned that that um, for space purposes, you know, Facebook is is a free place that hosts a whole lot of people. And for um, in order to be fair to everyone on Facebook, everything, if you do a video or something like that, if you're not paying for it, if it's free, everyone has a limited amount of time, uh, you know, for the space that Facebook reserves for every person that's on it. And so, therefore, sometimes the signal gets dropped. Um, the Facebook live feed will say, well, your time is almost up. It'll flash and tell me my time is almost up. On Spreaker, I'm actually paying for the time, so I know how much time I have on Spreaker because I'm paying for it. I do have a Facebook marketing page. However, um, I like to do videos here on my private Facebook first, and then I went, after I do the video um, and the podcast and everything, I, I uh, share it to my, my Facebook marketing page. And so that way, all of you who are my Facebook friends and family, because you're my half of you are my friends from from just work or just encountering in life, my uh, my Navy buddies and stuff like that, my military buddies, and then the rest of you, are my blood family on both sides of my mother and father side of the family, and then uh, all the churches I've been to, uh, from the churches I've been to, um, we're still family, we're still Christian family, right? Right? We're not blood family. We're born again family. Right? So, <laughs> and I'm doing the two cameras again. I got, I got my Skype camera here with for for um, for Spreaker. It's also using Skype camera. So if you want to go that way, um, and I'm still learning how to do that. All right. Um, so now, right now, I want to say a prayer um, for the people. In all the disasters areas. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the sweet name of Jesus Christ. Asking you to please look down. Look down on all the people who are are suffering right now. All the people and all the people related who are suffering right now. Because of your... uh, The hurricanes that that, uh, you brought upon, upon this land. All the people who are maybe suffering right now that... That people would be moved, that people would be moved to begin to put more faith in you, Lord Jesus, that you are the one and only uh, Savior of all mankind. There is no other, and you share your glory with no one. Um, Heavenly Father, please, during this this time, you know, we pray that all the people who lost their lives, that they were had come to repentance, and that that. Even if it was the last minute of their life, like the thief on the cross, that they had come to some type of repentance about their life and asked you to have mercy and forgive them and, and allow them to come into the kingdom. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, read it off my list. <laughs> all right, we're going to start from the top. Okay, I hope all of you people are, are, are um, 
if if you're not at work or something like that are, are listening welcome kelly thank you for thank you for viewing thank you thank kelly 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 green foxworth okay uh your name is on the list too but i'll skip your name because you're watching i see that you're watching okay let me see there's a button here that says know who is watching you okay there's the only person who's watching me right now off of facebook is kelly i guess everybody else i have to come in when they come in or see the recording all right but anyway in this recording you're going to hear a quasi bryant that's a third cousin of mine that's my cousin's son one of my cousin's son quasi bryant uh welcome welcome i hope that you can get to all of you can get to see the video or um listen to the podcast on spreaker anthony pacheco that's a cousin of mine on my father's side Welcome, Anthony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for viewing my videos. Bo Wembley, brother from California, Church of Christ in California. Celeste Frederick from Priest Lake Church here over in, in Nashville. Uh, Charles Adafope, he's a former co-worker of mine, brother in Christ, co-worker of mine in, in, from uh, Nashville VA Hospital. Uh, all right, so uh, Danny Wilborn. I'm not too sure about Dan. Oh, Danny Wilborn. I met him at uh, uh, Youth for Business. Uh, there's another pastor here. I keep forgetting his name, but right across the street. Uh, um, what is it called? Uh, Manor, something for Manor. Okay, this is church. And what they do over there is they have a Youth for Business program where they where they um, teach young. Uh, black children or minority children, how to run a corporation, and I, and I met Danny Wilborn from there, uh, and I could, I couldn't remember where I met him from, but but uh, you know he shared with me. I I shared him on my Facebook page, and and then I saw his picture, your picture, Danny, and and then it, you know it came back to me. I'm sorry, you know it was just a few times encounter where I went over there and I and I saw him. So it was it was kind of like one of those things where. I couldn't just I just couldn't remember where I met him from but but thank God that you know that uh you came and you you wanted to view my videos and and things of that nature and you following me. Thank you. Elizabeth Nokibia. She's a co-worker. Eva Quinones, uh my uncle Raymond, uh Anthony Pacheco's father, Uncle Raymond, that's that's uh his wife. Uh Eva Quinones. So my uncle Raymond Pacheco. So welcome, uh, Senora Quinones. Okay, Gustavo Maya. Gustavo Maya is one of the people who is in Florida right now, and I haven't heard from him. He checked in when the storm first began, and I'm praying for you, Gustavo. He checked in uh, when the storms first began, but I haven't heard anything from him because we know, we know, as we know now, there's a lot of people in Florida with no electricity. Uh, no clean water, no, and we're praying for you. you know, he's a brother in Christ, and, and, and all of the people down there, whether you're Christian or not, we're praying for you. We're praying and asking the Lord. I just pray to have mercy on you, because, uh, you know, it's a devastating thing. And also, I got friends and family over there, and uh, and, and Christian family and friends over there in uh, in Houston, Texas. You know, a good dear friend of mine. Uh, Ebonique Muhammad, uh, her daughter, Daniqua, is over there um, praying for, for them over there, too. You know, a uh, very dear friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, and, and some other people I know, you know, that was either in, in the military or that I encountered uh, throughout my, my life experience over there in Houston also. You know, of course, Puerto Rico, I have cousins and family over there and and all those islands over there, to, from the Virgin Islands to the French Islands, uh, uh, to the Florida Keys, and all those places over there. You know, my wife, my brother-in-law, um, he has. He said uh, I called him. He said that his family's on was on the unaffected side of, well, the sort of unaffected side of Florida. So, so they're all right. You know, his family hosts family reunions down there in Florida. You know, he got so many family members down, down there. So, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure we all got relations and things down there in these areas. And even if we didn't, you know, it's just the right Christian thing to do to, to be concerned. You know, somebody asked me at work earlier today. Um, they said, she said, uh, 
And I think she was just asking me just to see what I was going to say because she already knows. She's a church-going person. She said, uh, well, she didn't know I had a family member down in those areas. But she said, um, because I was speaking about my concerns about it and things. And she said, she said, you a Christian, man. You know these things are supposed to happen. So why are you so concerned or why are you so, so, uh, hurt or, or you feel remorseful for, for people when you know these things are going to happen. And I, and I said, well, you know what? Uh, when uh, Lazarus died and Jesus waited for four days, knowing that he was going to go and raise Lazarus up from the dead, even though he knew he was raising Lazarus up from the dead, when he got there, when he got there, he saw all the people weeping. What did he do? He started weeping himself, right? So I said, well, if Jesus started weeping, why did Jesus start weeping even though he knew he was going to raise the people up from, from the dead, you know? Raise Lazarus up from the dead. And, um, well, then she said, well, because they was, she was his friend, you know. So, you know, I, I, I kind of knew she was probably trying to ask the question. Sometimes people, you know, when you profess yourself, and sometimes people don't understand it, even, even though you tell them not to do this, they put you on a pedestal. When you profess yourself to be a minister or something like that, you're living out for Christ. You know, the way this world has got it so messed up, that's why I said, if you love me, don't preach lies. That's why we're teaching this. You know, the world's got it so messed up, they start to paint a, a false picture of what a minister ought to be about, you know, these days, you know. Now, let me finish reading the rest off my list. I wanted to read uh, Ira Pacheco. That's my brother. Okay. Uh, let me see. Where is my mouse pointer? Where is my mouse pointer? Okay, there you are. Okay, let me see where we are. Where are we? Ira Pacheco, that's my brother. Irving White Jr., that's my cousin on my mother's side of the family. Uh, Jeshwana Brown, friend from from uh, VA Hospital. Kelly Green, I got you there. Letitia Storre, I hope you are listening. And, or you can listen to the audio cast or the video, watch the video. She's also a friend of, of VA Hospital. Liney Carlton, that's my sister. Uh, my blood sister. <laughs> Uh, Lauren Gonzalez, also, I'm not sure where Lauren is, I, I'm hoping and praying, uh, I don't know, I, I, I met you from Facebook, and I'm not 100% sure if you are living in any of the affected areas, but if you are, if you aren't, I know you have some family members that, that are there, so we're praying for you, uh, Loretta Kelly, Kelly Powell, that's Sister Powell from, from Priest Lake Church, Marie Gordon. Hmm. I think she's from also from Priest Lake Church. I'm not sure. Michael Spears, old Navy buddy of mine. Pat Woods. Met you from uh, Nashville VA Hospital. Patricia Robinson is someone who emailed me. She's listening off of Spreaker.com. She was listening and she emailed me because I was giving my email out. And I probably start should start doing that again, my, my email, so that... People who listen to me on YouTube and stuff. She was listening to me on YouTube. And and she emailed me. She said she appreciated the sermon about uh, going astray. The the one that it really affected her. Doing, you know, the one that I spoke about. Uh, Luke chapter, uh, chapter 2. About the caretakers of Jesus Christ. Wandering off and leaving Jesus in Jerusalem. She was really moved and touched by that. The spirit moved and touched her heart, you know. About that, that right there, and so um, I put her on my list. And then Paul Nance is from uh, Priest Lake Church. Church. Uh, Roger Harris. Roger Harris is an old um, friend of mine from California. Uh, met through, I would say, met through the um, Church of Christ over in California when we were members of that church. Sharice Hill, same thing. Sharice Hill is was also is also still a member of the Church of Christ. Shatika Brown met you over here at VA Hospital a long time ago. Tiffany Wade, sister from Priest Lake Church of Christ. Uh, Tracy Williams. Tracy Williams is, I met her from Church of Christ in California, but she long time ago moved back to New York City. I believe New York State or New York City, New York State. And uh, we're long time, long time friends. Travis Tullis from Priest Lake Church of Christ, and then uh, William Jenkins. I think William Jenkins also. I think I met you either off of Facebook or I can't 
can't remember everybody. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, just if you're listening or whatever, just hit me an email or something or text me or something like that. Remind me where I met you from because, as you can see, I met people from a lot of, I meet people from a lot of places. And and these are just the people, these ain't all my Facebook friends. These are just all of you who have taken the time out. And I appreciate, I really appreciate all of you taking the time out to listen uh, to my either my podcast or, um, you know, uh, or the video because it's a blessing. I'm nobody special. I'm just Daryl, you know, a born again Christian trying to trying to build a better relationship, personal relationship with Christ as I encourage all the rest of you to do. All the rest of you, you know, um I'm not in this alone and I'm not better than anybody else and and please, you know, I always tell you, don't be put me up on no pedestal, you know, because like I like to say of myself like just like John the Baptist, John the Baptist, you know, Jesus said when you went to go out to see John the Baptist, he asked the question, did you expect to see somebody in fine clothing and all that? No, you didn't because he was out there in the desert dressed in rags. I'm not going to say I deliberately dressed dress in rags, but, you know, the content of my character is that, you know, I don't I don't put anything past people who do have those things. But, you know, like that, like I said, that painting, that picture of that pedestal, sometimes people put put us ministers and preachers on a level that you have to have you have to have a whole lot of money in the bank. Well, you know, these days, and I'm getting into that with this with this sermon topic, you know. A lot of times, you know, and I'm not putting any pastors down, I'm not putting anybody else down. Um, but a lot of preaching out there right now. And I got to say it like, you know, the Lord tell me to say it. You know, like the prophets of old, like John the Baptist, anybody else. A lot of preachers. Whether they be on television, whether they be just have the, a, a, a local church. And I'm not condemning anybody. I'm asking my brothers and sisters who are preachers and leaders and, and things of that nature. In, in my preaching, I'm asking all of us, in, in, especially in these times, to stop sugarcoating, watering down your message. Tell the message of Christ like it says in the Holy Bible to tell. Stop worrying about, well, if I start talking the full truth, my flock can't handle it and they're going to stop coming because, because they really have itchy ears. And if they stop coming, then, then, then that's less people tithing. Now get this, that's less people tithing and therefore I won't be able, we won't be able to keep our, our, our church open or, or the lights on. Or we won't be able to pay our bills and, or do our taxes and all that kind of stuff. And it, on and on down the line, it kind of trickles into the leaders of the church won't be able to afford those nice homes they're living in if the, if if they really start preaching uh, the biblical truth about Jesus and about salvation, and about repentance, you know, because you know, just like John the Baptist, you know, what happened to John the Baptist when he started telling the truth, you know, what happened to the Peter and Paul and all the rest of the apostles when they really started telling the truth. You know, I'm going to ask all of you, all of you. I mean, I don't care what kind of visionary you think about Christianity or whatever you what what's in your mind. You know, a lot of people these days equate and I'm not giving these names out. I'm not giving these names out to, to condemn them or anything like that. I actually if they like Jesus said, do what they do, but not do what they say, but not what they do. OK, Many of these evangelists and television televangelists, I don't care if it's uh what is it, Joel Osteen, T D Jakes, um, Cleflo Dollar, Benny Hinn, all of these people, they are teaching the truth about the Bible, they're teaching truth about healing, they're teaching the truth about that. But the one thing that I'm calling my brothers, especially in these times where we see the eclipse, we had the eclipse, God is in control. Lives are going to be destroyed. Things are going to change. People are going to die. And I'm calling all my brothers and sisters who, who say they're Christians. Stop sugarcoating your message. Stop watering down your message. Tell the message, the true message of Christ. Because my salvation and your salvation and the people's salvation is more important than the amount of money. That, that you're pulling in to your from your churches. Don't get caught up in that. See, sometimes we can it can happen to anybody. You got all this money rolling in. 
You know, especially ministers. We're still human beings. We all. I don't care if you got a licensed bishop. You've been a bishop. I don't care if it is T.D. Jakes or, or Joel Osteen or anybody. It's very easier. It's much easier for a person who has a lot of money and responsibility to start loving that money more than that loving, loving uh, Christ. And to start, uh, I would say, twisting your sermons or neglecting to talk about certain things because you're af- you become afraid that people are going to turn away from you like they turned away from Jesus. Remember, Jesus said something and a whole bunch of people was following him at one time and then a whole bunch of them left and the only, only people who, who stuck, up, stuck around him at that time was the 12 disciples. And he asked them, do y'all want to leave too? You know, but the rest of the people said, this is a hard teaching. We can't bear it. What was going on there? You know, now let me ask you something. Do you think if Jesus Christ was preaching the same message that these ministers on television or they preach or that speakeasy, I call it speakeasy, speak this into existence and that into existence. I mean, if you ever read the Bible or not, do you find that kind of a preaching in the Bible? Or do you think that the Romans and all these people were arresting, persecuting, beating Christians upside their head, kidnapping their children and feeding their children to dogs, dressing their children up? The first century church were being martyred. Why were they being martyred? Were they being martyred because they were telling people, if you put faith in God, God's going to increase your bank account? No. That's not why they got arrested. That's not why the God's... Our Heavenly Father's most highly favored apostles were going to jail, spent a lot of their time in prison, being beaten, rejected, told not to preach uh, that name. Do you, you understand really what was going on? Why were so many people in the world, you know, why were so many people in the world, you know, full of devil, full of the, the devil, of course, why so many people in the world? knowingly or unknowingly uh, realize, should realize that if you are not a born again Christian then you belong to Satan I'm going to say that for the, um, that's the one thing according to the Holy Bible if you are not a born again Christian according to the Holy Bible if you are not confessing that Jesus and Jesus alone or Yeshua HaMashiach is his Hebrew Aramaic name but if you can't confess that he alone is the only way to salvation. If you can't confess that, we're going to do some cross-referencing in the Bible too. If you can't confess that, if you're going around saying stuff like Jesus Christ is just one way of many different ways to make it to the same place, I got some news for you. You're still lost. If you're going to say something like that, you're still lost. You're not, you're not saved at this point in time in your life. And we're going to get into that and show you why. Uh, you know, uh, as we read some of these scriptures, and we're going to cross-reference too. The reason why we're going to cross-reference is because I, you know, I did some research. I googled, I googled some things, you know, just just to find out why certain uh, pieces of scripture might be might say certain things in English. And of course, it's true. That's why I, don't, I tell you don't don't sit there and tell yourself. Well, I'm going to read this version of the Bible, and God don't want you reading other versions of the Bible. That's also a lie. I say, you know, that's why maybe the title of this one is, If You Love Me, Don't Preach Lies About Jesus. (laughs) Don't preach lies like that. Don't preach. I'm sorry. Some people, one of the other reasons why I'm a for profit minister and I'm not connect, I'm not really connected. Not even to my own church that I go to right now. I, this ministry is not necessarily connected uh, through government. You know, of course we're connected through the, through the body of Christ. But I'm saying this, this establishment being a for-profit ministry and then the upcoming for-profit, for, um, for, uh, for-profit benefit corporation, excuse me. The for-profit benefit corporation, why it's not a a, a 501c3, why it's not this. One of the things I'm realizing now is because, you know, I am talking to all my non-profit 
brothers and sisters who are ministers and pastors and things like that in your churches. And we're going to get in that in your churches. You know, I'm, I'm calling y'all to repent. If you know that you haven't been telling the, the true message of salvation, what are we supposed to be delivered from? What are we supposed to be saved from? And you haven't been doing that because you're afraid and you've actually compromised the word of God because you're afraid of losing funding for your, your particular church. You're afraid of that. You know? You've forgotten that whether they whether people come and bring you money or not, first of all, I don't have it here in my list, but first of all, you got to remind yourself about something. Abraham, when the king of Sodom, you know, when the king of Sodom wanted to reward Abraham with with merchandise because Abraham, because of Lot, went went and rescued the, 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 the people of Sodom away from the, uh, I think it was the Assyrians or somebody like that. I can't remember exactly. But um, y'all could Google the story and look it up. When Abraham rescues the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom went to try to bless Abraham with some, some money and, and other materials and things like that. And Abraham said, said to him, basically, it doesn't say literally in the Bible, but Abraham let him know that the only reason why he had nothing, he didn't want to have nothing to do with the kingdom of Sodom and everything. That the only reason why he even went out to rescue them was because of Lot. His nephew Lot and his family. You know, and, and, and he was going after Lot. And it just so happened that everybody else. But, but Abraham let the king of Sodom know. He said, look, you know, he told him to his face. I will not allow anybody on planet earth to say that Abraham and his household uh, was blessed by from anything from the kingdom of Sodom. You know, Abraham already had, the Lord had already blessed Abraham with things. And, and, and that set of precedents throughout the whole Bible, really, throughout, throughout Christendom and everything else, Judaism and Christendom and everything else, we are not supposed to be receiving money Accumulated, you know. Oh, this is a hard message because a lot of people don't twisted this up. But in the eyes of God and in the Word of God, we're not supposed to receive financial anything from people who have accumulated that money through an act of sin. Yeah, did you hear me right? We're not supposed to be because according to the Bible, that's what it says. God don't like that. God don't want to bless His children. With the devil's money. <laughs> anyway. So if. That's why I'm telling you. If, 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 if you're not preaching the true message in your church. Or your church is accustomed to not preach the true message. Whether it be about tithing or anything else. Some churches will try to tell you. You don't have to tithe anymore. Which is a lie. My last, my last uh, podcast video cast was about that. That's a lie. That's a devil's lie. And I'm, and I'm not condemning anybody. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we need to repent about that. Okay? They tell you you don't need to tithe anymore. But God said, bring that tithe belong to me. Everything belongs to God anyway. God said it belonged to me. And just because Jesus, and I always try to show you, just because Jesus rose and died for us and nailed himself on the cross, the only thing that that... That, that change from Old Testament to New Testament is that you don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. You don't have to kill animals or kill other human beings. Yes, yeah, some nations in the world, come on, Alex. Have y'all ever seen Apocalypto? The movie Apocalypto? What were they doing? They were sacrificing other human beings and they weren't the only ones. There was some people in Africa that still do that. And uh, in New Guinea and some of these Pacific Islands... Cannibals, headhunters. There was people in uh in in over there in the Pacific. Uh, when they went to war, you know, they went impressed the woman that they wanted to marry by showing her how many heads. Y'all can Google this stuff if you don't think I'm telling the truth. How many heads they went into battle with with another tribe, and then the warrior, he was a warrior, and he was the best warrior because he brought back a whole bunch of heads he lopped off. Okay, that's that. 
all that stuff like that, you know. So, um, that stuff exists. <laughs> I, I, let me just put it that way. That stuff exists. But, uh, you know, uh, the thing was that I was saying that, that Jesus Christ, when he was became that once and for all sacrifice, it was so that other people and animals and things like that would not have to be uh, killed or slaughtered for the sacrifices. Okay? Outside of that, every other uh, commandment of God is still in effect. It did not change. <laughs> that did not change. He says, I, I am the Lord. I did not change. That's what he was talking about. Yeah, okay, there's no more animal sacrifices, but everything else is still in effect. Every blessing and every cursing still in effect. Okay? Now, so um, to try to save your time, what I wanted to do uh, was go back to Acts 16.16. 16. And the reason why I wanted to go back to Acts 16.16 16 is like I just said a few minutes ago. We, the, one of the first things we have to stop doing as uh, Christian ministers is, is uh, because we're afraid of persecution or whatever we might be afraid of, is telling people that, uh, that uh, other religions out there, other things like that out there, look, look at these natural disasters as, that are happening. One of the things we need to do, one, number one, stop telling, stop telling people, I hear it on, on, on these televangelists all the time, that God does not bring disaster. Okay, y'all know that's a lie. I done shown you in the Bible. I'm, I'm about to show you some more. Y'all know that's a lie. You know, how y'all going to sit up there and say, God does not bring disaster, only Satan does, but God allows. That's talking in circles. Okay, when the Bible itself, and I've shown y'all scripture after scripture, and I can show you a whole lot more, where God himself, according to the Holy Bible, that's what I'm, I'm preaching out of, right? I ain't preaching out of no other book but the Holy Bible. And I'm cross-referencing referencing different versions. And the reason why, like, for this right here, we're going to go to Acts 16.16 16 and, and some things I, I found. If you are reading out of, like, maybe the King James or some other Bible, what, what it says here in Acts uh, chapter 16.16 16, uh, in, in that section, when the, the demon-possessed woman is uh, following behind, uh, we're getting to that, we're following behind the Apostle Paul and them, uh, and, and, and Luke and all the rest of the Apostles, they're going out trying to tell people, call people to turn away from sin, and that Jesus Christ is the only true Savior of all mankind, and this demonic spirit is inside of this woman, Going behind them, changing the message to, oh, they're teaching just one way of many ways to be saved. But it, it's written because of the translators. And see, I'm being honest with you. You say, well, sometimes translation is wrong. Yes, sometimes translation is wrong. But what I tell you, pray about it. The Holy Spirit is always right. And he'll get you, he'll get you that information that you need. And. And he gave it to me through Google. You know, you can Google it yourself if you want to. If you don't believe me, about Acts chapter uh, 16, starting in verse 16. And uh, your, your King James Version may will say uh, that that woman was teaching the way of salvation, right? Use the word T-H-E. That's because uh, what they discovered is that that you know through the uh, Greek writing, the Greek writing or the Aramaic or whatever writing that they, they, that uh, King James and all of them recovered, the particular letter character that um, that was used in that original language can be actually translated into uh, T H E or just the letter A in English. A way instead of not the way, and uh, this Bible I'm holding right here, the uh, the New American. If y'all see that, the New American uh, uh, Bible Trans Revised Edition. This is Saint Joseph. Here, there we go. My phone call. One phone call trying to get in. 
and and see there there we go one phone call already you know the, the devil don't want this message to get out that's why I'm encouraging all of you come come listen to me on uh Spreaker if you can you know or listen to the whole message after it's recorded you can just go to Spreaker Radio and hit the record button you know that's going to help help me also uh because of those commercials you hear those people are paying me uh, you know, they they might be paying me a penny, but God's going to bless that penny or a penny or two. But, you know, everything that's coming in is a blessing. And I want to thank y'all if y'all go on and, and uh, just listen, you know, um, so that we can we can build this up. Um, anyway, so in, in Acts 16, 16, in this version, they they have it right. And he says here, this is the Catholic Bible, um, which have. Which have some books in there that are questionable. You know, that's probably why they didn't they didn't make it to the Bible canon, Protestant Bible canon. They're questionable because some of the things in there, okay. And but but this is why I cross reference because at least for this passage, um, the Catholic Bible has the correct the correct uh, view. And I want y'all to listen to me as I read it because and, and look in your own Bible and you'll see what what what's going on here. Uh, verse 16, he says, As we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl with an oracular spirit. That wasn't a spirit from God. That was a spirit from the devil. She was demon possessed. Oracular spirit. Because God says what? God says he doesn't like divination at all. And anybody that's doing divination or witchcraft, whatever, whatever you want to call it, Wiccans, uh, witchcraft, tarot cards, horoscope, numerology, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I ain't never did it. Hey, welcome, uh, Brother Spears, Michael Spears. Welcome. Uh, uh, I'm not going to pretend like I ain't never did it because we all grew up. Uh, my family, we all grew up doing that. You know, like, just like I said, uh, Le- Leviticus chapter 517. It's really important scripture that I want to bring out to y'all. You know, and it just made me think about something else that I did want to mention. What I want to mention is this. Some people, our people, a lot of people on earth, what happens is why is it that we call ourselves Christian or or we don't call ourselves Christian or when the Bible says something um, contrary to what we normally know as, as the truth, you know, it's it's a human I think it's human nature, to, the first thing to say. say. Say like if your parents neglected or did not even know themselves to teach you a commandment of God out of the Holy Bible. And then as you become an adult or old enough to know better, you learn that a particular activity that your mother and father were doing in the home or never seemed to have a care about it or never seemed to, to want to repent about it. They've been doing that kind of stuff. But then you learn out of the Bible that... Um, that God says this particular activity is not right. And usually most people, the first thing you're going to say is, well, this is the way my mother and father raised me, if it's contrary to the word of God. And I'm not going to change because a book that was probably just written by a man, that's what most people say, probably just written by human beings, says that something we've been doing from generation to generation to generation in my family bloodline is a sin against God. And I'm not going to say that because if I say that, that means all my ancestors and everything who participated in this particular activity are in hell. Now, some of y'all might not know that even in the first century church, you know, that's why there was a prayer for the ancestors. Okay. What that means is that a lot of Gentiles, no, their ancestors were worshiping false gods and didn't get to hear the message. So so um, there was a prayer that was for the spirit of the ancestors that, that the people who became Christian now and accepted the word Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior now uh, could pray that the Lord did not put the, their ancestors' spirit who didn't know any better uh, in hell and that be, because of Leviticus chapter 5, they know that these people died and didn't get a chance to hear about salvation. You know, that, that was the prayer for that. 
And a lot of our our foreparents died and didn't didn't get the, this message or were told a lie by some preacher or pastor about about uh, God's expectation on their life, and so they never really repent. They didn't even know they were doing wrong, and they didn't repent. So so when we say that, when I I try to encourage uh, people that with my own life, there came a time when I had to decide. There were certain things not taught in the home. There were certain things taught in the home that, of course, this is my mother and father. Or my mother, they love me. They've taken care of me. They brought me to adulthood. There was Mama was there for me when I was sick and everything like that. But when I read the Word of God and, his, and, and some things in the Word of God and His commandments says, thus and thus certain type of activity is not allowed in my sight and I don't like it. And I knew that in my family, they had no problem with me doing it. Had the same struggle, had the same response. You know, wait a minute. Am I supposed to put more faith in, in some words coming out of a book than in my family? Than in my mother and father and all that kind of stuff? And, well, bottom line, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it's not easy, but yes. If we're Christian, if we really believe that the Holy Bible is telling us the truth of God, and we learn that that uh, we haven't been doing anything, doing certain things that the Bible says we should be doing, or we haven't been repenting from certain things, well, we need to pray for our ancestors just like they did. First, we need to repent from those things ourselves and pray for our ancestors. Well, anyway, here here in verse seventeen. You know, I'm, I'm going to try not to read everything. But in verse 17, it says, She began to follow Paul and us, shouting, These people are slaves of the Most High God. For those of you who don't like slavery, if you're a Christian, you're a slave of Christ, of the Most High God. She said, These people are... Uh, Most High God, who proclaimed to you a way. She was saying one of very, or the demon inside of her was saying one of various ways to attain salvation. She wasn't saying the way as if, if to say they're teaching you the way. You know, she said this for many days. Now, personally, I don't know why Paul and them, I don't know what was going on back there. I, I, I'm Daryl. I, I wasn't even born back We weren't even born back then. I don't know why. Um, the spirit that has never really told me why, maybe one day he, it will, why uh, the apostles allowed this. They knew she had a demonic spirit in her. Why did, but why did they allow her to follow them for so many days while they were trying to preach the gospel? Okay, so I don't know, but, you know, maybe they're not perfect. They weren't perfect either. We are, we're all not perfect. But, it says in verse 18, she did this for many days. Paul, finally, became annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, not to the young lady, but to the spirit that was possessing her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Then it came out at that moment. And what I what, what did I come in saying about uh, before I, we read the next line? Preachers and pastors, knowing you are about to lose some money, there's certain things in the Bible that if you don't ne- if you don't preach the truth about it, you always avoid these subjects. And you're avoiding these subjects because you know you're gonna excuse my French, you're gonna piss some of your congregation off because. Deep down inside, they really haven't repented from these sins. So you never talk about those things. You preach a good service. You got We got people coming and praising and doing all that kind of stuff. But there's certain things you, there's certain subjects, topics. Darryl gonna, God called Daryl to talk about these subjects, just like the prophets of old. God called me to talk about these subjects, and I'm going to talk about them too. Be why? I'm not condemning anybody. I want to get make it into heaven. I don't want to be locked out of heaven. And I don't want anybody I love or preach to or I, that know me can ever say that I didn't tell them the truth. I didn't tell them what they really, really, what we really, 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 I'm going to say we. 
so y'all don't feel like I'm, I'm excluding myself. What we really, really, really need to turn away from in order to be allowed in the kingdom of heaven. The kind of activity we really, really, all of us. Disasters are coming. Disasters and things are coming. To all of us. It's going to rain on the just and the unjust alike. But I really, 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 really don't want the Lord to say unto me. Like he says in Matthew chapter 7. Not everybody who says Lord, Lord to me is going to make it into the kingdom. But everybody who does what my father wants. And I'm praying for all leaders. Stop neglecting to teach the young people growing up. What God really, really wants. Because you're afraid of being persecuted. Like the, like the, the apostles. You're afraid of being arrested. You're afraid of somebody trying to take your life. You're afraid of losing money in the church. So you don't talk about certain things. And if you do talk about it, you try to say that lying message that because Jesus Christ nailed everything to the cross, you don't have to worry about your sins no more. You're not perfect. And we all know we're not perfect. The apostles never said they was perfect. We all know we're not perfect. But, but people like to say, we're not perfect, therefore, and, and the other one, don't judge me, this, this, that, and the other. All in the, in the hopes to justify, basically what they're saying is, allow me to continue to wallow in my sinful nature. It makes me happy, and since you're not perfect either, you have no right to, to confront me about it. That's the message that you hear out of a lot of churches. I don't care what race you are. You hear that message a lot. And they even preach that stuff. Oh, you know, oh, uh, what right do you have? And twisting the, the parables around. What right do you have to, to pray and tell somebody else they wrong when you wrong? Okay. Now we read that. In, uh, and I'm going to go back to that. Psalm 51. Ha! Psalm, Psalm 51. When David, when David... Uh, ask God for forgiveness uh, because of what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. He asked God for forgiveness. He had the audacity. After all he did, he knew he did wrong. He asked God for forgiveness. He has the audacity to ask God to forgive him. God has the audacity to forgive him for it. But one thing he states in that psalm, and we're going to go back to that because because uh, I'm going to try to have that as like at the end of this. Uh, we're going to read that psalm and then we're going to um, have a prayer of repentance for all of us. He asks, he says to God, forgive me and I will go tell the wicked man his way and turn and teach the sinners to turn away from their sin. He was saying right there, a lot of people will say, well, if you've been preaching the word or something like that and then you wind up doing something wrong, you need to go sit down and hide in the corner. Now, that's the devil. You need because you've done something wrong, you need to step down. You can no longer preach the gospel and do all this kind of stuff. David, after doing what he did, said, Forgive me, Lord. Although I know I don't deserve forgiveness, forgive me. I will go out. Whether you forgive me or not, Lord, that's what he was saying. I'm still going to go out and tell the wicked man his way, knowing that they're going to say, How you who are you to tell me? What I did wrong after what you did. You know Dave, David knew that, that that was going to happen. People do that. Who's the Apostle Paul to tell us what we did wrong after he was going out killing Christians for so long? Two to four years killing Christians before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Who is he to tell us we live in wrong? You know, how can he be an apostle? He wasn't there on the day of Pentecost. So how can he be an apostle? Because Jesus made him one anyway. <laughs> God called him to be one. <laughs> it didn't matter if he was there on the day of Pentecost, you know. But it didn't it didn't seem to matter. It don't seem to matter to God because Paul wrote most of the letters in the, in the, in the New Testament or that that we have, uh you know. It didn't seem to matter to God that Paul was once killing Christians because after he repented after he repented he, be, he became whatever God called him to be 
the creature, the new creature that God called him to be. And, it, and it's from his writings that he wrote from prison. Not from a, a three-story mansion, a big old, big old acres of land and a, a field with, with pet dogs and everything and, and a picket fence. Even, even in the book, even in uh, the prophet Isaiah, I, got, I, I'm, I have to Google it later and I'm going to put it up in, in, in one of my other s- sermons. Uh, the prophet Isaiah said something similar to the effect that he said, Whoa, you know, in the Old and New Testament, the word woe means shame on you or, or you're in a terrible state, a curse on you from God. I'm going to stop right there. Okay. Okay. Another interruption. See, the devil don't want me to tell y'all this. But but Isaiah even said, a curse on you from God when you have so much money and you get this big old mansion. There were people back back then and back in, in even pre-Babylonian conquering. There was Israelites doing this. You have this big old mansion and all this land. You so rich. It's just you and your wife. You ain't even have kids. You don't even have children. He said, woe unto you. When you have a big old mansion with nine bathrooms. Nine bathrooms. And if you got nine bathrooms, you got all these other rooms. It won't even, it won't even uh, allow the rest of your people to even come step, set foot on your door without being arrested. Well, you know. Don't do nothing for the homeless, but you done made all this money off of the rest of your own kinfolk. And you got nine bathrooms in your house. And and he said similar something similar to the fact you got nine toilets and one and only one, excuse my friend, only one ass to sit on <laughs> on the toilet each time. <laughs> that's that's somewhere in the book of Isaiah. He said that, you know. But he is saying, whoa, you know. So you don't see true apostles and all that kind of stuff. I'm not knocking anybody. If if you say God blessed you with the big mansion and everything, okay, okay, maybe he did. I'm not going to say he didn't. But I am going to tell you that I found something in, in, in the Bible that says, woe unto you if you amass all this material stuff and then don't want to, don't, or even, even this, most people who are in the business of, televangelizing and you know that you got all this stuff from the people's money that people that gave you the money yet can't nobody come up on your mansion and you, you, the people that that you're not even sharing this with the people who helped you get it <laughs> it's all private property how is it private property if, if if the congregation was the one that helped you get it what's this private property stuff Paul wrote most of his letters from prison. He didn't write his letters and, and preach his sermons from, from a mansion. And Peter and all the rest of them, they ain't have all that. You know? And I'm not saying, I'm not knocking you. If, if God really gave it to you, hallelujah. You know? But then it's not what you, you acquire through the, through the word of God, through Jesus Christ. It's what you do with it. Right? I'm not going to sit here and like, I'm, I'm in business too. And, and yeah, yeah, I might need... Money to keep my lights on, or, or as I've been telling y'all, I want, uh, I'm praying and asking God that we, I get up enough money to have a studio in order to take uh, Darrow's Dream and the upcoming for profit benefit corporation up to the next level to be able to do more for the this community here and and abroad. Yeah, that's the that's here in this world. That's the only way you can do it by raising money. But your salvation for, to me, God made it this way through Daryl. Because I know what God brought me through. Your salvation comes first. And, it, and, and looking at it now, why God told me to do it for profit, don't go non-profit, is because the message that I have to teach you, the message that I have to preach, that God has given me to preach, I can't, and it's just probably just me, I can't. Be dependent on, on certain establishments and finding out, going to different churches and finding out that the message, the Christian message is being watered down 
or they're avoiding certain topics because that you know they get so worried about uh about uh news and membership that they that they don't preach the truth anymore and where does that leave you i, I made that post i said i'm not going to preach a sermon that keeps my lights on but keeps you in the dark your spirit in the dark in the dark so that on the day of, when when Christ come back or on the day of judgment you anybody can sit there and say you know if Jesus is going to lock you out of the kingdom of heaven can't nobody say well Daryl never told me Daryl never told me that I needed to turn away from this 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 that and other cuz Daryl keep telling y'all straight from the bible whether you like it or not Daryl's going to tell you straight from the bible that's what Daryl's Dream Ministry is all about. I'm taking Holy Bible and I'm presenting it to you, no holes barred, straight. And I'm even showing you got a Bible. So if I'm telling you anything that's not true, you can look it up in your own Bible, pray to God and, and ask Him. But Daryl is telling you the straight truth in love. Well, anyway, so she was shouting that. Uh, the demon was shouting that. And then Paul Paul exercises this demon. And then when her owners, she was a slave. She was she was a slave, so so she had owners. These owners knew that she was preaching a lie. But for the sake of money, they didn't say anything. They didn't care. When pastors and preachers, when y'all start doing that. You don't really care about your flock making it to heaven. You're just trying to get some money for it here and now to keep your lights on and keep all that kind of stuff on. God promised all of us that he will keep us. He, we don't need to sugarcoat our message. We got Jesus on our side. We belong to Jesus. We're going to be taken care of anyway. Your needs are going to be taken care of anyway. So long as if you profess yourself to be a preacher or a pastor or something like that, you're telling the real truth in your message. You're specifying. You're telling these people, this is what you need to turn away from. And look, you can look at anybody in the Bible. Like I said, they wasn't getting arrested for telling people, put faith in God. Uh, like, like you hear on TV, put faith in God. And, and, and know that no weapon against you, formed against you shall prosper. And then... Uh, before you know it, you may start out with, they always tie it to money. You may start out with only $2 or a penny in your bank account, but by the end of, of you putting your faith in God, he's going to give you a six figure, he's going to bless you with a six figure income down the line, down the line, down the line. And sure enough, some people put their faith in who they believe in Jesus Christ and they acquire these things, but they don't turn away from their, the rest of their sins. And if you're looking at that, it, it, they don't turn away from their sins. and they So they think, and then like Joel Osteen, you say this little prayer, and, um, and forgive me of my sins, but they never specify what sin is. Forgive me of my sins, and, and, and now you're saved. Now go, He says, now you're saved, now go find a, church, a, a local church to, to get a, be a part of. Right? That's what he says a lot on the, at the edge of his messages. I'm pretty sure he knows that when the, when the people go to the local church, that they're going to get told the truth about salvation and everything like that. But at the same time, that causes a lot of conflict. A lot of people do not go go and go to regular churches because they think that Joel Osteen just told them they were saved. And they think, I mean, Joel Osteen hardly ever uh, speaks about this. And if he does, and if like T.D. Jakes and them do, they speak around it. They can't come out and directly tell you. And I made that maybe because of, of they don't want to violate any laws with the television stations and everything. Here we, here we go again, or the radio station. The radio people, the people who own the radio stations and the television stations might say to them, well, you can preach about this, but you can't preach about this because if we if you start preaching about this, we're going to have to take you off the air. Take me off the air. <laughs> I'd rather you take me off the air 
Because John the Baptist was out in the desert. People still came out to him. He was out in the desert. He ain't had no Wi-Fi. He ain't had no cell phone. No nothing. And he was dressed in rags. But people who wanted to be right with God still came out to him. That's, you know, John the Baptist had a mouth. And what happened? Even Herod and his brother's wife, now his wife was coming out there to him, out to the desert. You know, he was on a passageway and he wasn't, he wasn't arrested because he was telling King Herod and them uh, how to make a, how to make a, a, a couple of extra dollars. The uh, the Sanhedrin didn't go out there to... The keepers of the law didn't go out there to John because uh, John was telling people how to make money. They went out there because the church was losing... The, San, the um, synagogue was losing money because they were paying taxes to Caesar. Let's get that straight. They had to pay a certain amount of taxes to Caesar. Just like we here in America, you got to pay a certain amount of taxes for anything you do, right? They were paying a certain amount of money to Caesar. And they knew that they were making less money. Where, where are the people going? They're going out there to the desert to hear this man John preach about self repentance, right? And then they were saying, well, well we preach... We have the uh, scripture police. We go around and tell people uh, not to do this in public, not to do that in public, not to do the other in public. And we the children of Abraham and we preaching. How come they keep going out to John instead of this big old massive synagogue with all these pretty lights and everything? They're going out to see some man in the desert dressed in rags. Why? Because that man out in the desert ragged. One thing they did not have is the anointing of the Holy Spirit <laughs> on all that they were doing. The anointing was on John, and then from John, it went, John saw it go down on Jesus after he uh, baptized Jesus, right? So, see, so one thing they didn't have on their side was God. They were doing all these things in the name of, in the, name of, of, of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But they were doing things in, in the likeness of Aaron's two sons. They were doing a whole bunch of stuff that God, for God, that God didn't tell them to do. Right? Okay. So, you know, just like here. So when the owners saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the public square before the local authorities. Okay? Yeah, that's persecution, arrestation. They about to get the snot beat out of them for telling what? For doing what? For telling people how to make make a few extra dollars in their bank account? No. For telling people I, that what I see, a lot of people think God loves me because he put me in the house. God loves me and he doesn't love somebody that's still out a bum out on the street. That's not 100% true. Because God could put that bum there. That bum could be an angel for all you know. Just to see now that he's blessed you with a house. Now that he's blessed you with all his money. Are you going to walk by this homeless person and not do anything? God still puts us to the test. After you got all this stuff. After you ask me to forgive you and bless you and acquire all this stuff. When someone else is in need. Are you going to walk by, you're going to be like the rich man in Lazarus and walk by the person and act like you don't see him or what? <laughs> or are you going to do so? If you, if you have the ability and the money to, to do something to help somebody, what are you doing with the blessings that God gave you, right? You know, if you don't have that, then you need, you're one of the people that need to be blessed with it to do it. Okay? So there's this big false impression that, that, to be right before the Lord and all this other kind of stuff, um, you know you're living right for the Lord when he starts blessing you financially. That's not 100% true. Because there's a whole bunch of rich people that you know ain't living right. And they got their riches off of what? Off of sinning. And I just said earlier, God don't accept 
uh, offerings from 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 money that people acquired doing wicked things. He don't want that in his church. And I I read Malachi chapter one about bringing in a um an offering with a blemish on it. When you're supposed to bring your best, that's bringing in an offering with a blemish because of where you got yes because of where you got it from. Yeah. I know some people that are my, well, my church don't mind where I take the money from. Your church probably don't mind because they worry more about making enough money to pay their bills than they are about your salvation. You making it into heaven. And I am not going, if God, when God, excuse me, excuse me, when God blesses me with something, if it even is financial, I'm not going to sugarcoat my message and, 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 and not tell a person just because they want to give me some money. I, I, won't, I can't be bought. I'm not, I'm not going to be bought by anybody. You know, bribe me. Let me give you this money. That's, that's what the Roman Catholic was doing with penance. They come pay us, buy these, buy, pay, pay your penance, and, and we will speak on your behalf and forgive you of whatever sin you're doing. Roman Catholicism, the, the, the people that are doing that, you know you're wrong. That's why the, I don't care if you sit there. There's nothing in the Bible to say put the, that old uh, hat on your head and go off and tell somebody you the vicar of Christ. They don't say nothing like that. I mean, all with all due respect, the Pope, the pastor, if you if you're really sincere in, in in doing things for God, God is gonna bless you for it. But but let's be real, it don't say nothing. You're not even in the Catholic Bible. I'm reading. It don't say you're supposed to do that. It don't say nothing about. Uh, and I'm saying that for the Orthodox Church too. It don't say nothing about you supposed to go up and kiss the ring and kiss the feet and kiss kiss this of the of the of the uh, the Pope or the 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 main leader, whatever you call them. You're not supposed to be doing all that stuff because there's only one Jesus Christ. There's nobody Jesus Junior. We know we're not supposed to be doing that, but that doesn't mean I don't respect you for the position that God has put you in. Because if you're in those positions, God has put you in those positions. But the thing is, the main thing we're trying to say here, and I'll even say the Pope. And I just heard something um, Stevie Wonder said. I like Stevie Wonder, but you know what? I got to tell Stevie Wonder, all them actors and actresses and everybody that's doing something for uh, doing something for the poor people. Keep doing what you're doing, raising money. Uh, so people can give. I don't give. People can give uh, some money. We give giving money to, to help the people who've, who've gone through the natural disaster. Yes, um, help first, ask questions later, right? Help first, ask questions later. So we're in the help first mode right now. You know, all of us, all the United States of America, all the whole world, we're going to help people out, all right? But if we're doing things, Malachi chapter 1, what does it, what does Esau say after destruction comes? What does Esau say? We gonna rebuild. And what does God say about that? Uh, if you gonna build it back up, and I'm gonna tear it right back down. We don't want to be building stuff up, repairing anything in Houston, Florida, uh, the Caribbean. We don't want to repair all this stuff. So that the people can go back to living their sinful lives again. Because it's going to get destroyed again. Because God said he's going to destroy it. All those people? There's, another, there's plenty of places in the Bible. Stop telling people God don't bring disaster. When God says in the Bible, yes he does. And he even tells us why he brings disaster. Yes, he does bring disaster. What difference does it make? They say, well, um, he doesn't bring it. Satan brings it, but God allows it. Well, that's still God. <laughs> See, that's, that's that, to me, that's talking in circles. God created all things, or he created Satan. So if it, even if Satan is the one dishing out the, the, the lashing. He can't do it unless he got God's permission. So then that still means God is doing it. And you don't even have to go that far because God says in the Holy Bible, yes, I'm the one who did it. I did it to you. Why? Because you ain't listening to me. You ain't turning back to me. And we're going to get to that. Now I'll show you where it says it too. 
All right, so um, I just want to remind you again. We're gonna. I'm gonna read Leviticus chapter five seventeen. I'm gonna read two seventeen, but I'm not gonna really talk about it. And then from there, I'm gonna to go to Amos chapter four. All right. That's for those of you who are listening, maybe never listened to me before. Um, something caught your ear. The Holy Spirit told you to just turn to me and, and come and listen to this message today. Okay, so I'm, I said uh, Leviticus chapter 5. Let's get to Leviticus chapter 5, 17. 5, 17 real quick. Flipping, flipping, flipping. Flipping the pages. Okay. Come on. Exodus. Leviticus. Leviticus 5. Verse 17. If someone does wrong and violates one of the Lord's prohibitions or commandments without realizing it, that person is guilty and shall bear the penalty. Okay? Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. Two seventeen says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, All evildoers are good in the sight of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of where is the just God or the God of justice? Now, we're going to go to Amos chapter 4. I'll show you, all, of, all those pastors and preachers, I'm, I'm just calling you, I'm not condemning anybody, I'm calling you to repent. Because you know full well, you hear that? You see that? I'm sorry, but the devil, he, he, he keeps trying, but we're going to get through this. You know full well, that is wrong to say that God does not bring disaster. When God says in the Bible, he does. And this is God speaking. Amos chapter 4. This is God speaking through Amos. And he says, uh, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who live on Mount of Samaria, who oppress the destitute and abuse the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring us drink. The Lord God, not Satan, has sworn by his holiness. Truly, days are coming upon you when they shall drag you away with ropes, your children with fish hooks. God is allowed doing this. You shall go out through the breach walls one in front of the other, and you shall be exiled to Harmon. Come to Bethel and sin. He's saying, saying right there, you come to Bethel and you involve yourself in sin. To Gigal and sin all the more. What he's saying there is, you come to church, And you praise hoop and holler in church. But after church is over, you go back home and do what? Sin again. He's saying that to all of us human beings. But I'm just paraphrasing, okay? You go into church. You go to Gilgal and sin all the more. Each morning, bringing your sacrifices to unto, unto me. That's God is saying, you're bringing your sacrifices unto me. Every third day, your tithes. Every third day, your tithes. They bring a tenth every third day. Shoot, we probably we struggling with bringing one every a tithe every every one day. <laughs> but people bring that stuff. And I, now, I'm not contradicting my other message. 
God is saying here, you're bringing me your tithes. You're doing that because that has to do with money. Okay? He doesn't have a problem with it. What he has a problem with is that tithes are being brought forward. People are like penance. They're paying. They think they're paying God off. Well, I'm going to bring my money and I'm going to pay, pay off. So God give, allow me to leave and go home and get back into my sinful nature. That's where a lot of us, of us treat church today. It's a routine thing. It's a fun thing to do. You go to church on Saturday or Sunday or whatever. Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. You love and fellowship. Give everybody hugs and, and praise the Lord. Just sing music and do all this other kind of stuff. And you go right back home. And get right back off into your sinful nature. And that's what God is talking about right here. That's what he's saying. Verse 5. Burn leaving bread as thanksgiving sacrifice. Proclaim publicly, not privately, your voluntary offerings. Now, <laughs> oh, look, come look and see how much money I gave to this, you know. Oh, pat him on the back. Oh, worship me. Look how much, I'm a millionaire. Look how much money I gave to, to feed the hungry child or whatever, or to help with this natural disaster. Oh, Give me a pat on, I deserve a pat on the back. I deserve an award, a placard, or whatever, right? Proclaim publicly your, your voluntary offerings. For so you love to do, Israelites, or anybody right now. Though I made your teeth, verse 6, clean of food in all your cities, and made bread sacrifice in all your dwellings. Yet you did not return to me. What is he talking about? I know a lot of people like now. I go to church every Sunday. What, what are you talking about, Father? What are you talking about? We give our tithes. We, you know, we praise your name. We do all this stuff. We sing praises all the time. We pray to you all the time. What is God talking about? You know, I know this message is is making somebody think. Wait a minute. Why is why is God Almighty saying something's wrong with this? We've been doing this all our our we grew up in the church doing this. So what what's what's going on? What's missing? Why is God still angry even though we're doing his supposedly doing his will? Okay, so now your dwellings and you not turn to me. You not return to me saith the Lord, or oracle of the Lord. Uh, verse 7. And I withheld the rain from you. He didn't say Satan did anything. I withheld the rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. All right? I sent rain upon one city, our almighty father, but not upon another. One field was watered. Hmm. I got to see what, what's going on here because uh, it's kind of getting kind of late. My son didn't show up. Well, I'll find out what's going on with him. Um, I sent rain upon uh, one city, but not upon another. One field was watered by rain, but the one I did not uh, water dried up. Two or three cities staggered to another to drink water, but were not satisfied. What is it that the people down there in, in, in the Caribbean and Texas and Florida are right now? They don't have any clean water. They don't have any food right now. God says he does stuff like that. Why? Why does God do stuff like that? And why do the people on TV and all these, these preachers say God does not do anything like that when, when the Bible says he does? What's, what, why would God do something? Why would our almighty creator do something like this? He said, and it dried up two or three cities. Two or three cities. Listen. 
Florida, Houston, cities. Two or three cities staggered to another to drink water, but were not satisfied. Yet you did not return. That he's telling you why. But what does he mean by that? Everybody live here's 2017. What does God mean by we haven't turned to him? He just said, Yeah, you're paying me your tithe. Yeah, you coming to church, you praising my name. But what is it that we're not doing? Alright? Then he says here, I struck in verse 9, I struck you with blight and mildew, mold and mildew. That's what's going to be left after all that water recedes, mold and mildew. God struck us with blight, mold, mildew, locusts devoured your gardens. Well, they say right now in, in, in Texas, the mosquitoes with the West Nile virus might not be locusts, but the mosquitoes is going crazy and and. And there's nothing that anybody can do because there's so much freestanding water there, swampy, dirty water. The mosquitoes are having a field day. They they multiplying like like fleas over there. And it and, and then two, not only West Nile virus, but what they ain't they ain't said nothing about Zika virus. They ain't saying, hey, Paul Nance, how you doing? They ain't said nothing about the Zika virus that these mosquitoes are putting out there in Houston right now. And matter of fact, I just thought about something. Ain't I haven't heard anything about the Dominican Republic and Haiti. They're talking about the West Virgin Islands, this the Virgin Islands, um, the disaster on the Virgin Islands. I haven't heard anything. Have any of y'all heard anything about Haiti and Dominican Republic? Nobody said anything. Is Haiti still there? Is Dominican Republic still there? Or did it get wa- did all the people get washed away? We don't know because ain't nobody. The news I've read ain't nobody said nothing about Haiti, nothing about Dominican Republic. It's supposed to be the same island. Ain't nobody said nothing about them. They said talking about the Virgin Islands and, I, and I'm praying for the people of Haiti and, and Dominican Republic that they're still there. But I haven't heard any major news media say anything about the, the, the devastation. Those islands did they did did they dis- suffer any devastation? Because Puerto Rico did, and I'm, I thought Dominica and, and Haiti is not too far away from it. I don't know exactly how. I ain't never been down there, but I don't know exactly how. But I know that the news media that I've seen so far ain't said nothing about these two countries. So how do the rest of us know? They say that um, cell phone towers is down all over the place right there. They say that uh, Virgin Islands and some of those islands, all the leaves got stripped off the trees. It was nice and green, but this hurricane unswept all the leaves and all that salt water came in, then came in on the land. Salt water, and now it's hot and it's drying up. You know, it's just a disaster. Why would God allow something like this? That's what some of y'all are saying. And, and, and right here. Y'all need to read the whole book of Amos yourself. But right here, Amos had to tell this message. And there was a lot of people. God wouldn't allow that to happen. You lying, Amos. God wouldn't allow that to happen. Okay. I mean, you you might feel, be saying that right now. The Bible is a lie and, and God doesn't allow this to happen. The preacher on the television told me that God don't do, do this as Satan does. And, and God does this. And okay, if that's, you want to still keep believing that, that's fine. I'm not a scripture policeman. I'm just bringing to you what the Bible actually really says. And the the, the title of my thing is, If You Really Love Me. If you love me, don't preach me lies about Jesus Christ. Don't preach me lies about the Heavenly Father. Don't tell me something that's not true. If you really want to see me and yourself in heaven with Christ, then we need to know the truth. We need to specify to me. What it is that I need to do to ensure that I'm going to be with Jesus and he's not going to tell me at, when he come back, get away from me. I never knew you. You work of wickedness. I don't want him to tell me nothing like that. And I don't want him to tell anybody that I love to say anything like that. So therefore, that's why it's so important for me to. Yeah. Anybody ask me, would you believe this Holy Bible over what your parents taught you? Yes. Because in. My parents wasn't perfect, and I'm not going to sit there. If, if something in the Bible says it's wrong, and my parents taught me it was always right, and, and if I had to make a choice between what the Bible says and what my parents said, 
When I was younger, I foolishly said, I'm going to do what my parents taught me to do. But now I'm older. And I, and I know that the Lord has kept me through so much stuff. I'm going to have to say, you know, mommy, daddy, I love you. But this word of God says this is what's supposed to be done. And like that Roman soldier in Matthew chapter 8, I choose to follow. I'm not going to argue with it. I'm not going to try to find a loophole around it like Aaron's two sons in Leviticus chapter 10. Because if I try to do something like that, it's only going to cause me to get burnt. <laughs> and and Daryl don't want to get burnt. <laughs> And I don't want any of y'all to get burnt. All right? So anyway, he says here in verse 9, I struck you with the blight and the mildew. Locusts devoured your gardens and vineyards. The caterpillar, the little old caterpillars, consume your fig trees and olive trees, yet you did not return to me. Oracle of the Lord. It says Oracle of the Lord, but then it says in uh, King James, says the Lord God Almighty or whatever like that, saith the Lord. That's the key point here. All these natural disasters. And you still got some people wanting to rebuild. Why? So that they can go back to living their sinful, wicked lifestyle. That's what rebuild, natural disaster. Everybody's dying, young children, babies, and everything. After all of this, how many people are going to start saying, how many of us are going to start saying, you know what? I need to make sure I'm, I'm right with you, Lord. Life is so quickly, life can be gone. My life can be gone in the blink of an eye. I need to make sure every day that you give me, that you wake me up, that I'm, I'm doing my best to do what's right in your eyes. Even if my flesh don't agree with it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even if my own flesh don't agree with it, I'd rather do what you told me to do than to what, I, what my flesh wants to do. Because I already know my flesh will get me in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> Especially when my flesh wants to do something that your word said I shouldn't be even spending even a thought, an inkling of a thought doing. But I know I ain't perfect. And every day you wake me up, I want to please you, Lord. I don't want to please myself. I'm afraid to please myself because I might I just might be um writing my last ticket. That might be the last straw. God could have said, Well, okay, I'm gonna have mercy on you and let you in excuse me, let you in the kingdom anyway. And then I'm gonna go off go off and do something sinful and get get myself and then he's gonna say, Well, you know what? Because you did that. <laughs> and I don't I, if, if y'all don't believe that way, if y'all don't believe God is that way, that's that's fine. But I'm saying between my relationship and the Lord, that's how I feel about, about my life. And, you know, because I know in the past, so many times in the past, I just let temptation get the, get the best of me. And I went on ahead and, and uh, participated in something sinful, um, knowing better. Now that I'm older and, and, and God has brought me through so much, I just don't want to. I can't afford... To, to, to go back. You know. And just like the old song says. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. You know. Um, and, and and I know that it ain't. If, if I do wind up in hell. It ain't nobody's fault but mine. Just like the song says. You know. Because I, why? I got a Bible to read. That's what it says in the song. I got a Bible to read. So if I die and my soul is lost. It ain't nobody's fault but mine. Why do why you think they saying that? <laughs> Because sometimes it's so it's so easy to read the word, but it's so hard to follow it, you know, for all of us, right? It's a war, you know, a spiritual war. But the, where's the war happening? Inside of me, inside of you. Who is my only enemy? Satan. I know this, you know. Does Satan know I don't belong to him? Yes, he does. Is he going to bring persecution and, and things my way to try to get me back? Yes, he will. Am I going to be foolish enough to fall for it? You know, I'm praying that I'm not. Not after all of this, not after after all this time doing right for the Lord. I don't want to wake up and deliberately. Oh, here's my son coming now. I guess his bus was late. It's raining outside. I don't want to wake up and deliberately do something. You know, or when when the Lord wakes me up in the morning. I mean, you know, shame on me to go, you know what, I want to go find somebody or find or do something 
to indulge in my sinful nature or my sinful desires, even though you woke me up, Lord. He woke me up. He could have kept me asleep. He could have. He could have took my life in the middle of the night. But thank, thank you, Lord, for wake. It's wrong to thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. Now I'm gonna go run off and do something sinful. You know, uh, to me that <laughs> that's just not right. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but it, that just ain't right. I can't do it no more. You know. Okay, so in in verse uh, ten. I sent upon you pestilence like that of Egypt. With the sword, I killed your young men and your captured horses. And to your nostrils, I bought the stench of your camps. All that Think about all that raw sewage that came up in Houston, Texas and all these places in Florida. Sewage systems. You know it's, and then it's getting hot. They, got, they said it's going to be 90 degrees. That All that stuff is going to come up and stink. Now, am, am I saying like, like as if there's no Christians in, in, in Florida? No, I am, I'm not saying that, but just think about what, what's, being, what's happening. Remember, I said in, we as Christians, we have individual blessings, but we are all inter, interdependent. All humankind, whether you're Christian or not. We are interdependent. So even if you are living up um, to the Lord's standards as an individual, if the people in your community are disobeying the, the Lord, whether they realize it or not, just like Leviticus chapter 5, 17, if the people in your community are living an unrighteous lifestyle, your community is still going to get affected. Even if you are doing right, everything right before the Lord. Nobody's being a scripture policeman, but if the people in your community and the young people in your community are not being taught the ways of God, they're, they're involving themselves in referee. That brings your, the blessing down for your community because that's, you read the Bible, that's what Israel is a nation. It's just not one person. God doesn't operate like that. He does operate, we do have a unique personal relationship with him, but it's also... We also have an interdependent relationship on our community. Church, the word church means community. And then if your community is not really living up to, to the calling, then next, the next thing is your, your city, your region, your city. Then here in the United States of America, your state. So that means if the city mayor, the mayor of the city, is not living up to uh, up to uh, the word of God, God's commandments, or the people are involved in, in your city government, local city government, are living unsavory lifestyle. It's going to have an effect on your the success of your city because God is still going to Leviticus five seventeen. The penalty is still there. You're being penalized as a community, and then it goes on to your state government if the governor and everything like that. Then it goes on to other representatives of of the, the country, your federal government, everything. If the people who uh, say they have power, like the presidents, the judges, and everybody else of your nation, and it, then it goes across to the whole world. If people are not turning away, you know, like I said now, United States of America covenant says uh, religion is separate from state. Or religion is separate from 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 the na- national law and all this other kind of stuff. Those people who formed the United States government, they had that for a reason because they didn't want people to be scripture policemen, policing people and stuff like that back then. But that does not mean there's nothing in the Bible that says God approves of people ha- running the country and exclude His commandments. And we are coming into that one world order, whether we like it or not. I'm, I keep saying it, and I, I and I go back to that that that, that eclipse, and these the national national the natural disasters. All these people, I don't care what color you are, what nation you are. I don't care if it's China, any place in Africa, all the the, the seven continents. You think and listen to me. And I know it's going out. And I'm not disrespecting your authority at any any point. But you must remember, 
It was God who put you in those positions. You get up in those positions, just like I just said to the pastors. You get up in that position and you start changing the message of salvation. Just so that you can get keep people's praise. I'm gonna say that about not about a lot of actors and actresses. And I'm not and like I said, I don't condemn anybody. I love Stevie Wonder. But he's doing that him and a whole bunch of people doing uh the fundraising and everything like that. This is what I'm talking about, how we try to build rebuild like Esau. And we try to sugarcoat our message because we're afraid. We're afraid of the people. We're afraid of what they're gonna do. We afraid of we Christians can get afraid. We Christian leaders can get afraid of something because we're human beings. No one wants to be treated, beat upside the head, and 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 all that kind. Of, I don't want that either. But for the sake of Christ, if 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 He's telling me to do something, none of the apostles got got arrested because they was they was uh telling people how to make a six figure income from a penny. That's not what they were got arrested for. That's not why they got kicked out of town and town, these towns and stuff like that. They started telling people, just like John the Baptist told King Herod. John the Baptist told King Herod what? You know your brother's still alive. Right? You know your brother's still alive. You know the word of God says you can't marry his wife. Even if she did get divorced with him, you can't marry his wife while he's still alive. You are violating God's commandment. According to, now, today, in this day and age, 2017, according to the Bible. And, and, and I, I keep telling people about this. Stevie Wonder said, oh, I love everybody. I have an album. And he says, I love you so much. And I'm not picking on you, Stevie, or anything like that. But when you get on national television and you use your popularity to say something like this. And I, I said the same thing about Barack Obama. So don't give me. I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. I don't care what you, what kind of power you got. What you could do to me. Because this is just flesh. As long as on the day, on the day of judgment. When we all stand in there before the Lord. When we all get to heaven. And we stand in there before the Lord. And I'm standing alone before him. And he say. Uh, Daryl Pacheco. Did you go teach the message that I told you to teach? I'm not going to sit up there and say, yeah, I did lie and say, yeah, I did. No, I'm going to teach the message he told me to teach. Now, what I'm getting to is that, you know, and, and not just Stevie Wonder, but it was just something that I heard on the news today, and it happened to be Stevie Wonder. It just so happened to be Stevie Wonder saying this. He is saying, we need to love. We need to do this. And then he threw in, and, and this is where the difference become, comes between being loved like, like, like God loves Jacob. Or being rejected or hated like he hated Esau. Malachi chapter 217. He said. We need something to the effect of. We need to just show love for one another. Which is true. And I'm not going to. And, and, and no I'm not saying. Well if you you come across somebody in the disaster area. And they happen to be. Uh, homosexual or something. Leave them there. No. Yeah of course you say their life. You know. This is for all of our Repentance. I'm not saying this stuff to condemn anybody. But when you make a statement like, well, um, even if they they same gender, we just need to love and, and, and stuff like that. You're telling children and you're telling people it's okay, like Malachi chapter 17. You're causing the Lord to faint. You're telling people it's okay to go back after we fix all of this natural disaster and everything. And after we cleaned everything up. And rebuilt this city. It's okay to go back to living that lifestyle. When we know the Holy Bible says. It's not okay for any of us to be doing that. <laughs> any, any human being on the face of the planet. To be doing that stuff. And I call it. And, and I call it the. Uh, Hollywood and everything like that. And like I said. You know. Um. The Bible said, like Jesus said, you know, there are worse things than homosexuality. So worse sins than homosexuality. So no, I'm not, I'm not 
singling y'all out, but even if you say something about LGBT, they're going to try to twist it and say, you hate us. I don't hate nobody. How can I, who am I to hate anybody after God has forgiven me for all of my sins? I ain't, I ain't hating nobody, but just like King David, I'm not going to go run in the corner. God has forgiven me of my sins, and therefore I will go out and preach the, preach against all biblical wickedness, whether anybody out there like it or not. Because I know that God is pleased with me. And that he has all the control. Just like he can control that eclipse. Just like he can control these hurricanes. And hold it back. Whatever. I don't care if it's Putin. Uh, the king of China. I mean the, the, the president of China. The king of Saudi Arabia. I don't care who you are. What you call yourself. We can't do nothing. When God make a move. We can't do nothing but sit there and wait to see what's going to happen. When he makes a move, he, he does whatever he wants to. And all the technology that we have, or the, that we think we have, can't do nothing to stop his will. That's just it. And if, and if that's just the case, the biggest problem that God has with humankind is that, that we listen to, the, to Satan like Adam and Eve did. You are the master of your fate. You control your destiny. We can do a lot of things because we were created in God's image. But he has the ultimate control over my life. You know. People say they're going to threaten me. I say, well, you know what? I mean, I've been held up at gunpoint before and everything like that. And I'm going to tell you right now, too. I was held up at gunpoint. And the spirit of the Lord came one time. Told me just before it was going to happen. He told me. This person's about to hold you up at gunpoint, but don't worry, because I'm with you. And I'm like, what? You know, and by the time I said what, the man held me up at gunpoint and everything. And all I could do, honestly, he was like, well, you know, I'm, he holding me up. I'm in a poor city. I ain't got a whole lot of money. You're going to pull a gun on me like I got something. He was a crackhead. You know, like I got something. I began to, I began to tell him, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but, you know. But you don't need to be pulling the gun on the child of God like that. He was kind of shocked. He said, well, you know, don't I, I got the gun on you. Don't you know I got the gun on you? This, 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 that, and the other. I said, I'm just letting you. He said, you trying to preach to me? I said, no, I'm just letting you know who you pulling that gun on. You pulling your gun on the child of God, and, and you don't have to. You could just ask me for whatever you want. And he said, he said, don't you know I could pull this trigger at any time? And then he flipped and said, you know what? Um, I don't want to be out here anyway. It's just this crack that got me going out here. And this, he started telling me what, what his problems was. And then he caught himself and he said, wait a minute. Why am I telling you this? All this, this, that, 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 and the other. You know, um, who are you? I, I, what are you? I'm not telling you about my problems and this, that, and the other. I'm the one with the gun. He had to remind himself he was the one with the gun. And... Uh, and we were in a dark place. We were in a, uh, an area on the street. There were no street lights or anything. That's why he, he, he stopped me right there. And I was out on my way to a, a friend's house. My friend Nicole's house, actually. I was on my way to visit her. And uh, we were in a dark place. And at that time, he said, don't, he said once again, don't you know I, I could kill you right now? And I said to him, the last thing I said, I put my hands up and I said, send me home to my father. That's why I know, I remember that's the last thing I said, and then I couldn't hear anything after that because I thought, I'm from New York City. This was in California. I'm from New York City. And in New York City, if a person pull a gun on you, um, they, they intend, to, whether you got money or not, if somebody pulls a gun out on you, everybody in New York City knows you might as well go ahead and use it. Because usually, if, if I was still in my, my human nature, you know, usually if you, you put that gun down, you're getting your butt whipped. <laughs> <laughs> and I might pick it up and shoot you with it, you know. <laughs> but, um, so he started talking, and he started jeering the gun like this. He started talking and everything, and I couldn't hear a word he was saying, because I was like, Lord, at least, if any of y'all out there jokingly want to call it browning points, I was like, I said what I said had to say, because I was like, well, at least, Lord, you know, if he does kill me, um, the last thing I said was something about you. Lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> if he does shoot me, and he was pointing at my heart and all this kind of stuff. Like I said, we were in a dark place. 
And I thought that was the end. Um, all of a sudden, believe it or not. Now, first of all, the second thing, you know, the first thing that, remember, I said the voice came to me before this man even approached me and said, this man going to rock. It was clear as day. And I don't really care if y'all don't believe me. Clear as day. He said, this man is going to rob you at gunpoint. But don't worry, I'm with you. And then all that other stuff start, started happening. Like I said, I was sitting there, my hands up just like this, and, and looking at him. And saying to myself, Lord, you know, if this is it, this is it. This is the way you want me to go. I'm, I'm ready to come to you. All of a sudden, a light from the back of my head, a big bright light shined. And it was like a spotlight and it shined right on this, this man's face. And he looked, he stopped talking, whatever. I didn't I couldn't understand what he said. He was, it was shining right in his face. Just like this light shining in my face, like this, it was shining in his face. And it, only his face did the light shine. And he looked up and he stopped. And he 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 had already pulled the he had already pulled the hammer back on the gun. I think he was getting ready to shoot me. He pulled the hammer back. And when that light, as soon as that light shone up in his face, he slowly, he was staring at the light. He wasn't even looking at me anymore. He put, he re, you know, reset the hammer on the gun. Put the gun in his pocket or whatever and then took off running. And left me standing there. And I was like, and then I looked up. After he ran and did that, I looked up and the sky was dark. There was not a light in the sky. I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> where did I knew where it came from, but I'm like, where did it, you know, the first thing is where did it come from? And to show you that, you know, human nature, human nature, to show you human nature, that was back in the Clinton days. Uh, the first thing after I, I went, I went home and I called the police. I went back home, called the police, and... Uh, well, actually, I went back to a payphone and called the police because my phone wasn't working. I had a beeper um, at that time. I called the police and went back home to wait for the police. They went and tried to round up whoever it was they, that, from my description, and they brought somebody that didn't even look like the guy. And they said, is this him? And I said, no, that's not him. You know, okay. So the guy left, and the police said, well, we'll still keep looking for whoever it is. It is out there. I said, you know, this is California. You ain't going to find him. He's probably long gone by now. Uh, the person who, who it was, he's long gone by now. Um, but then after I closed the door, in anger, anger started to set in. And I said, you know, at that time, I wasn't carrying any weapons. And I said, you know what? Uh, I've changed my mind again. I'm ex-military. I said, okay, fine. If that's the way things are going to be. I'm going to go, I went, I went to a place called Traders and bought me a gun. I had to wait 15 days, you know, not, not accepting that the Lord took care of me in that situation, but human nature struck in, you know, you, the first defense you want to do, I went, I went to a place called Traders in, in, on, um, I forget where it was in San Leandro, somewhere like that, East 14th street in California. It was a gun shop. Um, and, uh, I had to wait 15 days for the gun, so I went on, went ahead and bought me a a, a, um, a little a, a knife, sort of like the the kind of knife that Rambo had, and you know Sylvester Stallone and Rambo. <laughs> I went and bought that instead. Well, I bought the gun, but I had to wait on the gun. But I bought the knife to carry around with me, razor sharp, you know, and I would put it, keep it in the holster and stuff, razor sharp, and I kept it concealed. Because I said I figured the next fool that that rolled up on me, if it happened once, it might happen again. The next fool that rolled up on me at that time in my life, I was in my twenties, was going to get cut. And then when when I finally did get my gun, he was going to get shot. <laughs> he wanted to do something like that to me. Well, you know that was my human nature. Even though God took care of that situation, even though He took care of that situation for me, I still reacted like any other human being would probably. I didn't react the way that a that a born again person should. I glorified the Lord, but I I didn't react that way. 
you know, and it took a long time. It took, it took, shoot, it took, well, even after I got married and everything, we moved to other parts of, parts of the town. I was still doing it. I, you know, but it, it took some time. When, after my son was born and, and my son and daughter, then I got, I got rid of the gun because, you know, I didn't want to be them finding it. You know how kids look for stuff. And I didn't want them finding it, uh, uh, doing anything like that. So I, I got rid of all the weapons after that point. Actually, my wife was the one, and she told me she said she don't. She said she loved me and everything, but she, she, you know, and she knows that I'm ex-military. But she was like, you know, she's afraid for me to have these things around the kids. And honestly enough, you know, just like what happened, I should I should have been like, well, you know, the Lord protected me. I know if anything does happen to me, it's only because He's gonna allow it, because that is meant to be. That so, okay, so that's so that, right? So, you know, my kids are adults now and everything, but at, un, after that happened, you know, I knew that the if, if I had any weaponry or any self-defense things, it would have to be something, some things that, that um, neither I could harm myself by or my kids, if they found it, they couldn't really harm themselves with it, you know. So I, I, I just converted and kept weapons like that around. Um, uh, anyway, so long story short, you know, we all have moments and stuff of, of that nature, but, but, um, but to say now that, uh, you know, sugarcoat the message and say, oh, we're not, or just leave it out. Not, we're not going to talk about certain subjects or anything like that. We're going to preach. I want to preach love and charity and all this other kind of stuff, but I'm not calling people to repent or that I, I'm I'm worried about my life being taken, so I'm not gonna or any other preacher, you worried about your life being taken, you worried about um uh, something like that. So you're not gonna preach the truth. You're gonna leave people in the dark. You're just gonna preach enough for them to love you enough to want to give you all this money and set you on on easy street financially, but you're not gonna tell the truth. Turn away from this. Turn away from that. Turn away from this stuff. Why? And we're going to get to that because this stuff is not allowed in the kingdom of heaven. And if you want to be in heaven, I don't care who you are, what color you are. If you want to be in heaven with Jesus instead of winding up in hell, you need to repent and turn away from it. I'm not condemning anybody. I don't hate nobody. I don't care what the sin is. If it's biblical sin, we need to turn away from it. Biblical sin. And that's what God is saying right here in Amos. It doesn't matter to him if you're going to go to church faithfully. It doesn't matter if you pay your tithes faithfully. If when you get into your lonely place or in your private place, you go right back into participating in sinful activity that the Lord told us not to participate in. That doesn't matter. And yes, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a Christian and you think you are saved, but you're still holding on to all this stuff, that's questionable. You might be saved, but you're still reaping from the sinful things you're doing. Repent. Grow up. Get a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, you're building a relationship, personal relationship with him. It, how can you have a strong relationship with Christ if you're still holding on to the things that he died for, for us to be able to let go of, be able to let him wash it out of us? You know, the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit should be washing this stuff out of you. That's a false message to say, because Christ died on the cross for me and he nailed all sin to the cross, I can go back to living my sinful lifestyle. All right? Now, I'm going to show you a book that Pastor Paul wrote. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. The letters of the 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to go 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Why did Paul even write this letter to the Corinthians? Why? Because just what I just said. The people of Corinth were Christians. They were born again. They felt that they were born again and everything like that. 
And they were some of the first people who thought, because Christ nailed all sin on the cross, I can continue to indulge in my sinful nature. And Paul begins to write to them, all the first, and you look at all the first Corinthians, and you can see exactly what I'm, I'm telling you. Paul has to write to them and tell them, hey, wait a minute. You know, yes, Jesus did die for you uh, on the cross. He nailed all sin to the cross, but that's not so you can go back to sinning like a dog returning to his vomit or a pig returning to the mud. And I'm just going to read. Uh, I encourage you to read all the Corinthians or study all the Corinthians, but I'm just going to read uh, chapter 1 from, from uh, verse 10. Just verse 10 to, um, to verse, what is that, verse 17. But I encourage all of you to read the whole thing. And he's saying there, it says divisions in the church because of teachings like this. Or because of these beliefs that they can go back to their sins. He says, I urge you brothers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree in what you say. And that there be no divisions among you. That you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. Go to one church and that church over there says, it's okay for you to indulge in your sins. And another church over there says, no, it's not okay. Or they start picking and choosing between the churches which sins are okay to go back to and which sins are not okay. And then Paul says here, I urge you to stop all that and have some unity about what you're preaching. That you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, by closed people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. He says here again, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or was any of your pastors crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says, I give thanks to God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I baptized the household of Stephanus also. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, the truth. And not with the wisdom of human eloquence. Oh, right there. Wisdom of human eloquence. What is he talking about? And well, we just talked about that. All the, everybody who says they are preacher or pastor, but will not teach the real biblical truth and sugarcoat your message or avoid certain topics just so that you can keep the money coming in. Just so you can keep the lights on in your church building and all that kind of stuff. Not really caring whether a person is re- truly going to uh, born again. If Jesus come back, they're really going to go to heaven. Do you think you're going to get away with that? No, you're not going to get away with that either. But (laughs) people do it, right? Anyway, he says with eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. See, when we fail to tell the whole truth about repentance and we fail to preach against the things that the Bible says we're supposed to be preaching against or praying that people will come out, repent and come out of that activity so that they can be saved. It's not condemning. It's not fire and brimstone. We're bringing forth what God told all of us through Jesus Christ. What Christ, if we want to really honor Jesus Christ, we must honor all of the commandments and ask him, now, some of you are saying, well, you can't do all this stuff, all this stuff that, that God wants to do. Nobody's perfect. Not through your own strength. What did Jesus say? It's easier for a 
uh, for a camel to walk through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. And what did Peter and him say? Well, then who can be saved? And Jesus says to them, with man, this is impossible. But with God, what he's saying is, if you're trying to do it through your own human strength, it's impossible. But if you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it is possible. Because the Holy Spirit has entered you and is washing away all your sinful desires to the point where you could live that holy, holy lifestyle that I was talking about. It's not going to happen all for everybody all instantly in one day. We are all born again works, works in progress. We're all bay whips. It happens for some of us by the grace of God. Hallelujah. It can happen for you overnight or in a blink of an eye. But for, for a lot of us, it happens over time. Which is another reason why I don't preach to condemn anybody. I preach because I know, although I don't deserve any forgiveness, Jesus forgave me. How can he can forgive you from something? How can he forgive if sin isn't sin anymore? You have to offend somebody to, to be forgiven. How can he forgive you of your sins if sin if people are teaching that sin is no longer sin, how can you be forgiven from that? If people are teaching that because Christ died for you, you can stay in your sinful nature, or he don't really mind if you indulge every once in a while, or whatever whatever you saying, you telling yourself, if he don't mind, how can you be forgiven? Why would he even die on the cross? Why would he even go through the trouble of coming down here and dying for us and doing all that and redeeming us? That's mean buy you back from Satan. Doing all that stuff if sin is no longer sin. Like so many people are preaching right now. Or if they're not, like I said, if they're not preaching that sin is no longer sin, there's whole just to get more money in their church, there's whole topics they won't even touch on. And if they do touch on it, they'll go around it instead of directly tell you, just like John the Baptist directly told. He didn't care if he was going to get his head chopped off or whatever. He didn't know it. Probably didn't know he was going to get his head chopped off. But he knew his life was, you know, his life was in God's hands. He didn't care about uh, King Herod's status and all that kind of stuff. He spoke to him mano. What is it? Man on man. You know, he spoke to him face to face. And said the only difference. You, so you got royalty and I'm out here in the desert. In the river Jordan dressed in rags. But the same God that leads you. is That, that controls you is the same God that controls me. And you know you ain't supposed to be with that woman. And your brother is still alive. Man, can you imagine that? How his brother feel? How does brother feel about that? You know, they never said in the Bible, but can you think about that? Think about that in this day and age. What if, if I'm talking about every man, what if you marry someone, have a child by, the daughter was his, was Herod's niece. That means that daughter uh, was actually his brother's daughter. So you have a child by this woman and that child is even an adult. And then this woman leaves you for your brother. How you how would that how would <laughs> That's unfathomable, but that's what, you know, and so John confronted Herod about it because he knew, you know, that it was wrong and just because you royalty just because you're a president, a leader of a country, or this, this, that, and the other, doesn't give you the right to violate one of God's commandments. And that's why I say I don't like I don't hate Barack Obama or anything like that. But I personally felt like I would never turn and and turn my face or turn my back on God's commandments just so that I can keep my presidency or something like that, or just keep my popular my popularity status and say. And tell, a, tell anybody participating, it's not the people, it's the activity. 
tell anybody participating in homosexuality, not only tell them that it's okay now, when the when God does not change and he said it's not okay, but then to, to, to let people know with your presidential authority that it's okay to go get married. And then for some Christian ministers to even host a same-sex marriage. I'm not telling you what to do in your church, but I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. Who are you doing this in front of? I'm not a scripture policeman, but let's I mean let's be let's be real. If you know that homosexuality is an abomination before God, and you telling these people keep on doing doing this practice, participating in this, and God's going to forgive you and let you in heaven anyway, when he says in his word that he's not, you don't love those people. You don't care about, you don't really care about them. The only reason why, I may be wrong, but the only reason why a preacher, a Christian preacher would allow that to happen is he's saying to himself, I got a, a large number of homosexual people participating in homosexuality in my church, and they give a lot of money to keep our lights on. You know, I would rather not. I would rather support them in their homosexuality so I can keep the lights on in my church building than to obey God and tell them they need to re- repent and stop doing it. That's what be, was, was going on. I'd rather keep that financial support coming in than to let these people know that they are in violation. They are risking their salvation by by continuing to participate in this. In this activity. And Daryl don't... I, Daryl, I say that as third person. I don't want to be that kind of a preacher for the Lord. I'm representing Jesus Christ. I'm not saying I represent him perfectly. I'm not saying anything. Don't twist it. I'm not saying I'm Jesus Jr. or anything like that. I'm saying just like just like David said in Psalm 51. Forgive me for my wickedness. Forgive me for what I've done. And because you have forgiven me when I know I don't deserve forgiveness, I'm going to go out and I'm going to teach the people about wickedness. And I'm going to t- I'm going to encourage the sinner to turn away from his sin so that you can have more people in heaven and less people going off to hell with the devil in the final day. That should be more important than the, the amount of money that I, re, that I receive. And so maybe that's why doing this platform, doing a for-profit platform, I'm not really dependent on people. I got a job. I, I work in the hospital. Hallelujah. That's the job that God gave me. I work in the hospital. I serve people. I try to serve people and I try to do the best I can with all the patients that I, that I, that I work with. I'm not perfect, but I do the best I can. I do my best. I don't get into arguments with anybody. Um, these are fellow military. It's a veterans hospital. These are fellow military people. But you know what? The truth come out. Even if even if you are, were in the military, I'm gonna tell you something that's true. You know that we even sometimes people say some of the darndest things, and, and we as hospital staff, we need to service them anyway. We need to put away put away our personal feelings about what they say. I'm down here in the state of Tennessee. You know. We need to sometimes put away personal feelings and understand that even though this person might even be a racist and might say some terrible things about me, I'm still obligated to give him or her care. Irregardless of what comes out of their mouth, irregardless of how they treat me, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to still do my job. You know? So anyway, I got a job, and, and thank you, Lord, and and uh, and I'm trying to build this on the basis of of of, of um, business standards of what Congress and the law. I'm trying to obey the laws of the land, and I'm doing things this way. But I think now, you know, I'm thinking that that's probably why God called me to do it this way instead of becoming a nonprofit organization. You know, I have a feeling that you know. 
Um, from what I know, I, I've studied nonprofit organizations, and I know that a lot of times, you know, uh, brothers and sisters who who are pastors of churches and deacons and all of you, I I'm not I'm not condemning you. I can see that you're concerned about keeping your do- the doors open, and you're looking at it like, well, you know, keep the doors open so that more people can be saved. Right, but kind of it's defeating the purpose. If you're not telling the true message of Christ, people aren't being saved anyway. They're still lost. If you're not telling people the truth, and if you're allowing something to go on in your church that should not be going on, and, and, and I encourage you to read the rest of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And the Apostle Paul, he starts getting into to all that stuff. And, and see... When you allow those things to happen, that, he says, uh, the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning of a, or of its power. When we allow those things, we say Christians, and we see these people continuing to participate and say, I'm a Christian too. I'm born again too. And then the children are watching this and they're saying, well, what's the difference? And children, even cartoons, everything in the world that, that Satan has a hand in, encouraging children that you can do this, you can fornicate, you can get a divorce. And I, I, I spoke about that. that early. Yeah, people get divorced and, and God's not going to strike you with lightning. But if you do get a divorce, it is wiser. I'm telling you, it is wiser to say, okay, I'm, I'm divorcing this person or this person that we're getting divorced, but now it's time for me to move my life into a life of celibacy unto Christ. I don't need to be trying to go find somebody else up to shack up with. Now, I'm not just saying that, but of course a lot of people are like, no, no, no. You ain't tell me what to do. Hey, I'm not no scripture policeman, but I'm just telling you, you know, I, I read to you Malachi Malachi, God said he hate divorce. He hate divorce. He said he hate it. And then on, on that note, husbands are supposed to be, husbands, our commandment is that we're supposed to be loving our wives. And then wives, commandment. I got to renege on that because I think I said back in the, in the past that it, I didn't think it was a commandment. But it is a commandment. The Apostle Paul said there is a commandment um, that wives are supposed to be uh, submissive to husbands and be silent in the church. That is a commandment. But like I said, can you accept that like the Roman soldier? But husbands, you're supposed to be loving your wives, not beating on your wives, not cheating on your wives. You, we're supposed to be loving our wives. And, and if we don't know what it means to love the wife, don't ask the wife, ask Jesus. <laughs> ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what that means unto God to love your wife. And why, the reason why I say that is because we've all, men, women, here in the United States of America, we don't, we've been taught lies for so long, we don't know what's what. We don't know what it, most men admit it. You don't know, you don't know what it means to love a woman the way God says she should be loved. And women, you don't know what it means to submit to a, a lot of us. We don't really, really know, women, you don't really, really know what it means to be submissive to your husband as he submits himself to God. We don't really know what that means. And that's a struggle. That is an intermarital struggle that we have to pray about. And that's why we husbands and wives first have to even, even if we have a lot of disagreements, we have to, at the end of the day, forgive one another. Because that's the only way a marriage is going to work. Because it's so much that we don't know and that we have to pray and ask the Lord to teach us. That we're passing the right thing down to our, our children in the next generation. So, um, I wanted to just remind you about Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 10, verse 26. And it says it again, you know, about deliberately sinning after we learn what's wrong. And then... Uh, I wanted to, to talk to y'all about Revelations chapter 1 to 3. Right there, 
that's when uh, when John the Revelator starts talking about churches, the cities and churches. And I said in my last video, and I say it again, instead of looking at it as cities, look at uh, when he says like to the church of Laodicea or, or something like that, look at that as a spiritual ailment, a condition. What if, what if Laodicea was a medical condition, like a spiritual medical condition? Right? That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, when he says here, uh, let me let me do the first one. Uh, Revelations chapter 2. To Ephesians, right? The church in Ephesians. What if Ephesians was a condition? Listen to what I'm saying here. He says, to the angel of the church in Ephesians, write this. The one who holds the seven stars. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping. I know your works. Down to verse 2. I know your works and labor and your endurance that you cannot tolerate the wicked. You have tested those who call themselves apostles but are not and discovered that they are imposters. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? <laughs> Moreover, you have endurance. Sounds interesting, right? Uh, Moreover, you have endurance and have suffered for my name and you... Uh, have not grown weary yet. See, none of us are perfect. What if this is this is a condition of of our spiritual relationship with Christ instead of a, a, a physical church back in the past? Yet I hold this against you. Here is what where you have a problem that needs to be corrected. Yet I hold this against you. You have lost the love you had at first. Just like uh, Mary and Joseph, Luke chapter 2. You know, when Jesus was first born, all that stuff, blessed are you, Mary, blessed is the child, blessed is all. Mary was on, on high. And then um, SpongeBob moment, you know, 12 years later, something was going on in Mary and Joseph's life that they really didn't care where Jesus was. Okay, now, all, you know, you read chapter 1 of Luke, and all... Mary is taking all of this in. Oh, I, I've given birth to the child, the son, to God's baby, and uh, and He speaks so highly of me to want to put His child in me, and and Joseph is is going to take care of him. He's he's a caretaker, and Joseph loved me anyway, even though, and he put faith, and he knows that the angel came to Joseph and told Joseph, "Don't divorce Mary because she's telling you the truth." She ain't lying. Ain't nobody. She ain't go sleep with somebody and then try to say I'm carrying uh, God's baby. No, she's telling you the truth. So, so go ahead and marry her and everything. So Joseph marries him, and for that first two three years of Jesus' life, you know Joseph and Mary shoot. They took him down into Egypt to make sure that Herod wouldn't kill him and all that kind of stuff. But here it is, SpongeBob moment. Twelve years later. <laughs> Twelve years later. I mean, you know, I guess all of that excitement and amazement is gone. To the point where they can go travel a whole day away. Mary, his mother. Y'all got kids. Some of y'all got kids. Kelly, you got kids. Your son, when your son was 12 years old, your children was 12 years old, I, I'm pretty sure not a, not a breakfast Lunch or dinner did not go by where you said, where my child at? My child need to eat or something, right? And here's Mary, the mother of Jesus, right? She's supposed to be the patriarch. The, the Roman Catholics like to say, Hail Mary, even though she's not supposed to be held to, held to. They Hail Mary, full of grace and all that kind of stuff. And here is Mary, 12 years later, after giving birth to Jesus and all that kind of stuff. She let a whole day go by without even concerning herself whether he had eaten breakfast, lunch, or dinner. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not dogging Mary or anything. I'm just saying, of course, she's the mother of the patriarch of Jesus Christ. And blessed is she. But if it can happen to Mary and Joseph, where they a whole day away, then they had to travel a, another whole day back. It took them a whole day running around the streets of Jerusalem before the light went on and they said, he might be in the church. 
<laughs> they forgot he was he was uh, God's baby. And the last place they went to look for him took a whole nother day was church. They went looking for him in all other kind of areas of Jerusalem except for the church building. <laughs> and then when they got to him, they're the parents. Then when they the, they're the guardians, they're the parents, right? Now, if you lost your child, if you let your child stray away like that um, for a whole day, twelve year old child, and you let them stray away for a whole day, and they got lost for three days because you wasn't keeping an eye on them, and when the police find out, what they gonna tell you? Well, there was there was no police to do that back then, but. This day and age, what they gonna tell you? Are they gonna do like child? Why did you do this to Mary and Joseph? Was like, why did you told Jesus? Why did you do this to us? Instead of instead of saying, <laughs> instead of saying the truth, we were wrong because we didn't even care to see where you were, especially a, a mother. I don't know many mothers, loving mothers today, who would let their child go past the lunch, or breakfast, dinner, or lunch without checking on them, saying, "Where you at? You hungry? Something." I don't know. Somebody would leave it, leave it up to the other relatives. I don't care. <laughs> who are the other relatives? We thought he was amongst the relatives. Well, you should have went and checked. Did a head count? Something. <laughs> you know? Left him in that city. Left the twelve-year-old boy in that city. I know they always try to show you. I still, like I said, they always try to go to Luke chapter two to show how how of of godly nature Jesus is, and that he truly is the Son of God. And they never they never stop to tell to talk about that, you know. But that's a lesson. That's a whole lesson in itself about going astray, which which is what my lesson of going astray was about. You can, if you go to Spreaker, you can you can listen to that message. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying, so he's saying here, this is a could could be a condition. Yet I hold it. Realize how far you have fallen. Repent. See, ain't nobody trying to say nothing to to uh, uh, condemn anybody. All of this, all of what Daryl preaching is so that if you have, if you are guilty of doing something, repent. You are calling yourself a Christian and you may have me a minister or something like that. And you're not preaching and, and directly telling people because you're afraid of persecution or something like that. You're not telling these. And, 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 and like I said, I don't hate nobody, but I mean, I gotta call it what it is. You're not telling the LGBT people that they're locking themselves out of the kingdom of heaven unless they repent. You can't tell. You can't speak up and tell LGBT. LGBT people have been trying to infiltrate the church for years. They want the government to make a law saying you can't teach young children that same sex is wrong. They've been putting law. Atheists have been putting that law in the book. Try, can you imagine a church, any church, not teaching? And there are some. But shame on y'all. Y'all need to repent. Telling the church, but making it a, a, a man-made law that uh, Christian ministers or pastors or whatever like that cannot teach children because that's teaching children to hate homosexuals. I'm not teaching no child to hate homosexuals. I'm teaching the child to love you. Enough to tell you that God don't accept that. That's an abomination before God. And if you want to get to heaven, you want to make it to heaven, just like I want to make it to heaven. Jesus is the one who decides everybody who gets to heaven. I don't. But if if he put uh, he gave us a Bible to read, and in that Bible it says this is an act of abomination to God, it don't matter how your flesh felt, it don't matter what you felt. This is how I am when I came out my mama's womb. You always want to say that, but right there, John told, I mean, Jesus told, told uh, Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. Meaning, born again from above. You must be, allow yourself 
to be washed and cleansed of all your former desires, whatever you inherited from Adam and Eve. Allow your spirit, allow your soul to be washed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. And then allow the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come in and stay in. And quickly or slowly or quickly wash away your sins. Wash away the desire to do so. It's not a, it's not a, it is a miracle, but it's not an uncommon thing for somebody to say, you know what? I was doing such and such a sin, but ever since I turned my life over to Christ, I, something has got a hold of me. Just like, like one of the other gospel songs, something done got a, the Holy Spirit, we know it is, but something got a hold of me. If you would have been there, you would have shouted too. Something came from somewhere and made me feel brand new, right? The Holy Spirit came and sure set me free. Something's got a hold of me. That's a song. That's a gospel song. What are they talking about? Or the other gospel song. I'm not that way anymore. God has came and made a change in my life. I'm not that way anymore. So ain't nobody, even if you did, even if you committed a sinful act yesterday, whether it be whatever it be. Right? Now the message I'm, ta- I'm trying to talk about, don't teach me lies. I'm going to go to Revelations chapter 22. And we're going to go and read what Jesus said is locked outside of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to cross-reference, I can cross-reference to you. Or you can Google it yourself. All right, And sometimes even if you Google it, you might not find it, but but if you can Google uh, David Stern, the complete Jewish Bible, he's a, a Christian, Messianic Jew from, uh, he li- well, when he wrote this book, he was living in Israel. I don't even know if he's still alive. But in his book, in his uh, version of the Bible, is where I found in uh, Revelations 22, where it says dogs. It says dogs are locked out. You know no dog. God don't care about no dog. A regular dog that running around on all fours. Locked out of heaven. What does that mean? You know. Come on let's be real. What does that mean? I found out what it means is that. that that's what they used to say of. Uh, that's what a, a slang word back in, in those days. They gave to two homosexual men. When they had sexual intercourse, it was as it was sort of like you know, well, you know, sort of like two dogs mating, and so that's why those scriptures. And now I don't know this, if it's true or not about King James, but King, they say King James, uh, when he was growing up in Scotland, one of his mentors. Uh, Happened to be an undercover homosexual and molested him from from uh, early childhood up until when he got caught. When they got caught, uh, up until like maybe King James was like sixteen years old, and the rest of the the priest or whatever the Christian priest and stuff, they didn't even realize something was going on. But then when King James sort sort of came of age, he wasn't hiding it anymore. You know. That something was going on between him and this guy, so they got rid of the that that particular mentor. They got they got rid of him. I ain't gonna say what they did. You know, they they probably killed him or something. But they got rid of him. However, King James, from that time, was supposedly he still had, he still had because he was molested as a child, and, and this guy was his mentor. He still had some some uh, homosexual tendencies. And so I'm not saying that's the reason why he used the word dogs instead of just straight coming out and say it because according to David Stern, the scriptures did actually say in um, Revelations 22, he says that the, um, the old writings actually do, does say uh, in that scripture, uh, 22 verse 15, I believe it is, 
And I'm going to read it from his to show you and then uh, cross-reference it in the, the complete. Like I told you, the, uh, cross-reference in this, this uh, Catholic Bible. But the Catholic Bible even used the words dog. You know? Um, where is it? Okay. Verse 15. Right? Verse 14 says, How blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they have a right to eat from the tree of life and go through the gates into the city. He's talking about heaven or the new Jerusalem coming down. Then he says in verse 15, outside, and this is what we're supposed to be repenting from. I'm not condemning anybody, but everybody, you have your own personal responsibility to think about this. If you really love Jesus and if you really love one another, and if you really love people, you would want to see them in heaven. And therefore, not only you, but whoever is doing things with you, both of you need to repent and stop doing it if you want to really want to be with Jesus when Jesus comes back. I'm not condemning anybody. But according to the word of God out of the Holy Bible, if you keep these practices up, you're going to condemn yourself and be locked out of the kingdom of heaven because of your own activity. Nobody else's. Ain't nobody fault but yours or mine. If my soul get lost. That's what it say here. So verse 15 out of uh, the complete Jewish Bible says. Outside are the homosexuals. Because they never wanted to repent from homosexuality. Not because they participated in it. Because you never repented from it. And then, as a comma, not just homosexuals, those involved with the occult and with drugs. What is that talking about? Everything. Divination, witchcraft, tarot cards, reading your horoscope, and all of that. If you never repent from and stop doing those things. See, it's not just homosexuality. But Jesus is telling you right now, if you live the rest of your life never repenting from those things, never getting away from that, that kind of activity, you're going to wind up locking yourself out the kingdom of heaven. God is not going to allow us. Jesus is not going to say, he's with me. Let him come on in. Jesus is the one saying this. Now, I talked about that before. Those of you reading that red letter edition, Ain't no way that Jesus is going to let John, <laughs> the revelator, cut him off in mid-speech and, 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 and say his little two cents, which even if it... Okay. Amber Alert. You see that? <laughs> that Amber Alert came on. That's all right. We're going to get this out. Ain't no way... That I, I say Jesus, Alpha and Omega, who just said he's Alpha and Omega, going to fall silent and let John say, put his little two cents in, even if he did let him do that. For those of you who are going to say John said it and Jesus didn't say it, even if he did, wasn't John speaking from the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus, which is God anyway? He couldn't say something that wasn't in agreement with the Holy Spirit, and he's Smack in front of Jesus right now. So it, it all is still is God Almighty. It all still is Jesus Christ saying this. So let's not get it twisted. And then it says further. Drugs. Okay. The sexually immoral. That's fornication, prostitution, anything. Anything. Indulgence, pornography, whatever. If you like to indulge in that stuff and you ain't going to repent from it, you, you're telling God, I'd rather keep pleasing myself this way than to, to obey your commandments, you're going to find yourself locked out the kingdom of heaven. Because Not because God hates you, not because of the color of your skin, none of that. Because you chose, you, the individual, or I, if it's me, I chose or we chose, we human beings chose, I don't care what country you are, you in, part of the world you're in, 
We chose not to repent. All right? Sexually immoral, murderers, that's spiritual murderers, and physical murderers. Criticizing, bullying people, and all that kind of stuff, murdering people's spirit out of envy. Starting wars and Rubens Awards, killing somebody off of material things, obviously. Murderers. That's murdering. A lot of murder goes on. In God's eyes, it's murder. People try to justify it. We went to war. We went to this. Why are you fighting? You fighting with people. Back then in the day, they fought with people to steal their stuff because they didn't want... They'd rather go kill somebody else and take what they, they did instead of build their own. That's that's what wars that's what starts wars in the first place, right? Or you don't have it and you see them people over there with it. So you're gonna go pick up a rock or something and knock them over the head and kill them. Cain killed Abel for what? For what he thought he could take what Abel had and God would be pleased. That's what wars come from. Murder. Same thing. Now, idol worshippers. Back to Acts chapter 16, verse 16. All, everybody on the face of the planet that would rather say Jesus Christ is only one way of many ways to get to the same place according to the Holy Bible, according to Revelations right here, when Christ comes back, everybody who went on joined that bandwagon, you're going to be locked out the kingdom of heaven unless you repent. Unless you repent. But what does it say further? And everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the Messianic communities. Now, what does it say here? I like it where it says here um, in this Bible. It says there. Now we're going to go to 22. He says here, verse 15, outside are the dogs. Everybody said, now, now you know what dogs means. It means homosexuals. Uh, the sorcerers. Remember what I said? Witchcraft, all that kind of stuff. Tarot cards, palm readers, all that stuff. The unchast. Okay, the murderers, the idol worshippers, and all who love and practice deceit. And then King James says, all who love to live a lie. So that covers everything else. If you know you're living a lie before the Lord, and you know you're lying to children and telling them something's okay, like Malachi chapter 17, I mean 2, 2 verse 17, you know you're telling people God don't care about that particular sin anymore when you know he does. Or you know, you know somebody told you, like I just told you, that that's not true. But you choose to live that way. You choose to keep living your lie anyway. You're going to find yourself locked out the kingdom of heaven. Now back to what I said about it. I see a whole lot of preachers on television and stuff. Always talking about your finances. They say. And they're telling them the truth about God's word. Put faith in Jesus Christ. Because then you'll have that. Yeah, that penny will grow into a. A. a a million dollars or a thousand dollars overnight if you just put the faith in God, trust God. The word says you trust God and this, 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 that, and the other. That might be true. All right? But if you start getting blessings from what we just read in, 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 in Revelations chapter 22, if you start getting uh, blessings from, from, from things and you know you haven't turned away from, from your sinful nature, from doing the things, participating in the things that we just read out of Revelation 22, that's not a blessing from God. I'm telling you, I say it again, that's not a blessing from God. You got to remember that when Jesus was walking in the desert, the devil came to him and said, if you bow down to me, Told Jesus, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all of this, 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 that stuff in, on the face of the earth. So that's not a blessing from God. 
if I'm if I'm making all this money, they used to tell me. Some people used to tell me. Uh, back in California, I had some friends. I think his name was Lamel. He said, "There's a price." He used to say, "There's a price to pay for your soul, and Satan is willing to pay it." That's what he used to say. Not from Lamel Williams. Um, that's what he used to say, and it's true. You know, when when you start getting blessed, and that that that's what fools a lot of people. I put faith in Jesus Christ in the name of Christ and I spoke into existence all this money, all these blessed material blessings and they came to me um, and and I'm going to praise God on Sunday and go jump in the club and drink and get drunk on Friday night or Saturday night or whatever and then come and praise God in the morning because of all this financial blessing. Look at my car, look at my house, look at my, my mansion, look at my this, my that. I can take these... Nice, luxurious trips. And I attribute it to you, O Lord. Right? And, and, and I've called demons. Hey, Matthew chapter 7. And I've, and I've done so many things for you, Lord. And called demons out. And cast demons out in your name. And did all this other kind of stuff. What does Jesus say, right? In, in Matthew chapter 7. Or, or is it 6? One of them. We'll get to it. I'll get to it. I think it's chapter 6. Or it could be 7. Let me see. Matthew. I'm alright. I'm probably right. Chapter 7. Well, let's flip to it and find out. Let's see here. Chapter 7. True disciple. Okay, yeah, it's chapter 7. After the judging and, and stuff that people get twisted. Don't judge me. This, this, that, and the other. You can look at, uh, okay, so he's talking about, if you go up to verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the road is broad that leads to destruction. Allowing any and everything, and saying that that because Christ died on the cross, I can go do whatever the heck I want to do. That leads, that's what leads to Christians to destruction. And those who enter through it are many. Uh, 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 many people will enter that gate. How narrow uh, the gate and constricted the road that leads to life. And those who find it are few. We the few. We're really the few. The Marines say the few, the proud, the many. But yeah, you know the few, the the blessed. <laughs> the few, the blessed. <laughs> There's only a few people who are going to turn away from their sins. Then it says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but underneath are ravenous wolves. By their fruits you will know them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Just so every good tree bears good fruit and rotten tree bears a bad fruit. You plant a bad seed, you're not going to get anything good out of it. You keep planting these bad, we keep planting these bad seeds, telling these children it's okay to stay gay and all that kind of stuff. Ain't nothing good going to come out of it. Ain't nothing good going to come out of it. And then to turn around and say, God doesn't bring calamities. Well, we just read in Amos chapter 4, that's not true. You can read Malachi chapter 1. Evidently, God says he's the one that's going to destroy Esau each time Esau builds back up. That's not true. And you can see it for yourself in your own Bible. So don't let these people tell you that's that. Oh, Satan is the only one that brings disaster. Because God himself said in his word, he the one doing it. And he even told us why. Because we're not repenting. We're not turning away from the the, the true things that we need to be turning away from. So it's chastisement coming from him. And if we think we're going to build up rebuild Houston, Texas and rebuild Florida just so we can go back to indulging in our sinful nature, guess what? It's going to get destroyed again. And again and again and again until we get this right. (laughs) Other things are going to be destroyed too until we get right so we can go home and be with Jesus. 
It says down here, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father in heaven. Only the people who are willing to repent and turn from your wicked ways. It's no different from the, apostles, the, the prophets of old. Turn, turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear your land. If my people will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then the blessings of the Lord, of the Lord come to you. Not before that. God is not the one blessing you if you're still sinning. That's Satan. And those blessings are temporary. Because you're about to reap a whole lot of... If you planted the bad seed, you're going to reap a whole lot of bad. God don't change his word. If you sin against him, like Leviticus chapter 5, 17, you sin against our Heavenly Father, we sin against God, knowingly or unknowingly that, it, that we're doing wrong, we're still guilty and we're going to reap from that sinful thing we've done. Lest we repent. And stop doing it. And stop planting those seeds. Okay? So it says here, Many will say to me on that day, Don't be fooled. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not speak things into existence? We, be careful about that. You can speak something into existence. I ain't seen nothing in the Bible yet saying speaking anything to existence. But you be careful about what you speak into existence. Because 99.% of the time, those people who tell you that, they're telling you you're going to speak something material into existence. If you want, a, if you want a, a nice fancy house with a picket fence, just speak it into existence and it'll be. And if you, and like I just said, and if you do speak that into existence, knowing in your heart, that you have not turned away from, from what the Bible says is sin and an abomination before the Lord. And you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I spoke this into existence. Well, yeah, you got it because Jesus don't fail in his name. If he said in the Bible that whatever you say in my name, you'll receive it. Okay. That's what these people did. And so they thought, they're thinking that because they spoke something in Jesus' name and... and uh. What does it say here? Okay, many are say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and, and do all kinds of miracles in your name? Yeah, because Jesus don't fit. He said you can do this. You can make a mountain move. You say it in my name in the move. That's true. But that don't mean you're going to make it into heaven just because you, would, you was able to do that. Don't be fooled. All right? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? Did we not speak a whole bunch of stuff in existence? I always pray to ask God, please let that person know what they're saying. I'm not going to speak it into existence. I'm not going to claim this, I'm, but I'm going to claim that. And I'm going to do this and do that. Fine. You want to do it in Jesus' name? Fine, but be careful. All right? Then I will declare to them. This is why you need to be careful. Solemnly. In this book it says, I will declare to them solemnly. Solemnly. Jesus is saying this. I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Why? Let's connect that to Revelation chapter 20, 22. Verse 15. Why? Did Jesus say this? Because even though these people did all of this, Christians, or they believe in Christians, in Jesus' name, in their heart, they know they never stopped participating in homosexuality. They never stopped looking up them horoscopes, trying to see what, what the future 